Hello. Hi. Uh, long time no talk. Yeah, let's see how we do. <laughs> <laughs> well, we talked, but not not the show. Yes, we yes. The show. Which, so. that's the only kind of talking that counts, frankly. Yes, yeah. Content only, please. <laughs> Today, we're going to be learning about the German Democratic Republic. All right. I already wrote the top of my notes, East Germany. Is that okay? Yeah, it's the same thing. Okay, yeah. great. So that's just a formal name for it. <laughs> uh, you had between 1949 and 1990, you had East and West Germany. Great. So you caused the destruction. I did. I mean, 1990. Oh, yes. Uh, I, you know, it was, it <laughs> Sorry was to dox you here, yeah. but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it was totally me. Um, I heard I was on the way. They, just, they had to shut it down. Yeah, it was bad. But yeah, the German Democratic Republic, a.k.a. East Germany, was a socialist state uh, from 1949 to 1990. It's in the eastern region of modern-day Germany. Now Germany's just one country. We'll talk about why that is. For more geographically inclined listeners or listeners in Germany, maybe, or familiar with the region. These are the, uh, the regions that made up East Germany are East Berlin, Mecklenburg, Vorpommern, Brandenburg, Saxony-Anhalt, Thuringia, and Saxony. Mm. So there's like states. Okay. What are the big cities that are over there? I'm more familiar with the cities of uh, Germany, I think. Berlin. Well, Berlin, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But Munich was west? Munich was west, yeah. Okay. Well, Munich's in like in South Germany, which was the west. So. Okay, okay. Um, what other cities do you know? Um, I know <laughs> there's the other one, Frankfurt. I'm going to bet West because uh, Kyle was telling me that everyone calls Frankfurt Bankfurt because they have so many banks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was in West. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, Safe bet. Bonn is in West. Uh, other cities too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. So what do you know about the GDR. Wow, nothing. We just listened to its national anthem a minute ago. It was pretty banging. Yeah, it's it's a good one. Uh, check it out if you have not listened to it. It's <laughs> we maybe we'll put a clip in here or something. Uh, all right. Well, come on. You know, like there was the Berlin Wall. I know there was the Berlin Wall. Okay. Yeah, and that was bad. All right. People would like be separated from their families, mm -hmm. and you'd get like shot if you tried to climb it. Yeah. And. Yeah. Yeah, and then luckily, eventually, Ronald Reagan... Ronald Reagan saved the day. <laughs> he demanded that Gorby tear it down, and there we, here we are today. That's, right? all, that's what happened, right? <laughs> uh, what about, have you heard of the Stasi? No. All right, okay. So a lot of people, a lot of listeners may have heard of these guys. They're like the secret police. Oh, okay. It's like, you know, this huge secret police organization totally always spying on everybody. They're like worse than the Gestapo. Ooh. That's what we've heard about that. It's quite a term to throw around. Uh, we, you may have heard that, you know, East Germany is, you know, very drab and, and mm -hmm, poor. Mm -hmm. And uh, they used to have a lot, right? Everybody was just sad. They were oppressed. Uh, no one had the freedom to do anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, and luckily, it's gone. You know, Reagan <laughs> we did again, it. saved the day. And now we are free. So there, there are elements of that. Okay. That we'll, we'll kind of get break down, like, what, to what extent is any of that true? And to what extent is it a myth? And what was life actually like in the GDR? Um, and kind of speak more accurately to the experiences of people. Okay, great. We won't get like 100% in depth into everything because there's just too much. For sure. It's um, quite a lot. Yeah. But, you know, that said, we'll get to a lot of it, I think. Uh, a few source shout outs mm -hmm. uh, that I'll kind of reference as we go. Uh, one is a four-part docu-series put together by a group called the Communist Organization, but in German. They're a German <laughs> communist organization. Says what it is on the tin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, the, the four-part docu-series called Das Andere Leben, uh, which translates to Another Life. You can see it on YouTube. I linked it in the notes for you patrons. And it has really great interviews with people who lived in the GDR. Very, I think it's very insightful I'll kind of reference it that when I talk about the documentary. That's mm, okay. that's that one. Uh, there's also the book Black Shirts and Reds by Michael Parenti. It's not like just about Eastern. It's about like communism versus imperialism overall. Yeah, I've heard his uh, name around before. Yeah, he's he's good. Okay. Um, but I, I pulled some things about East Germany from there. Uh, and there's also the Pearls of the Round Table podcast. Okay. Uh, they had an episode about it. They're not around anymore, but um, tons of good facts there. Cool. So, Citing my sources. Great. <laughs> and we are rolling out a new Patreon reward this Oop. week. Yeah. 
I will be taking notes live as we record. And uh, back in the day when I had to take notes for school and college and whatnot, I doodled a lot. So we're going to see what happens. It might work. It might not. Maybe we'll cut this. Who knows? <laughs> we'll see. We'll, I'll judge it at the end and determine <laughs> if it's going live or not. Great. Great. No pressure. <laughs> All right. So let's start. How did we get the situation of two Germanys? Right? Mm -hmm. We know basically the origin story is before you had the GDR or the FRG, the other half, West Germany, you had Nazi Germany, these assholes. Mm -hmm. uh, the Soviet Union came in, kicked their ass, had some help from the UK and the US, uh, and then Germany is split up. It's occupied. Uh, some of it's annexed directly by the Soviet Union and Poland. The rest was occupied by the Soviet Union, the United Kingdom, the United States, and France. Gotcha. That's a lot of guys in one area. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they, they just carved it up, like the country, all of it. And then Berlin, they carved up too. Okay. Using the same zones. Berlin was wholly in East Germany. Okay. So it was like a little carve out. Yeah. You know, a little island. Uh, and so altogether, they would cooperatively govern Germany via the Allied Control Council. The problem was that the Allied Control Council had to do everything unanimously, and pretty quickly it was obvious that the Soviet Union and the United States had very different goals mm. for what they were going to do in Germany. So the reason they had different goals is because they were in totally different situations. The Soviet Union had been devastated by the war. Right, we talked about that in our Stalin episode. I mean, just like complete ruination, right? Mm -hmm. They have to rebuild and they're looking to make Germany a united, demilitarized country. Right. They, because these guys just fucked them up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and they wanted to make them pay war reparations to the allies. Okay. Uh, that, that's, that's, that was like kind of their goal. The U S for its part had not been devastated. And in, in fact, they were now looking to become a world superpower, you know, be the champ. So the U S increasingly saw the USSR as a rival. Gotcha. Uh, they didn't want Germany to be paying reparations to rebuild their rival. Right? They didn't want Germany to yeah, be giving yeah. money to the Soviets. Uh, instead, they wanted to rebuild Germany itself into a profitable market and to rearm it uh, as part of their upcoming anti-communist alliance, NATO. Gotcha. Right, so they wanted to basically turn the page on that whole Nazi business <laughs> and get back to being friends with these guys so oh. that they could, uh, you know, bulwark against communism. Great. Good and great. <laughs> yes. So I'm curious, and this is... Christine's putting on their fortune teller hat. All right. I've read a bit about post-war finances and how I think this was France, but like they basically kind of pulled a, an old world bank switcher on some folks, like gave them shitty deals. Um, mm. Industrially speaking, like, uh, like basically like treated them <laughs> like we treat third world countries today Yeah, and yeah. said like, you can't, you know, do manufacturing, but we'll give you financial aid, that kind of thing. Yeah. You're thinking, so the Marshall Plan, That's remember what was, we were saying yeah. that they were trying to do oil refineries and things. They're mm -hmm. like, no, 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 no. Texas does not want you to do oil <laughs> well, refineries. We've got our own. Um, Thank you very much. Yeah. So uh, that, that's part of it. They, okay. Uh, the Marshall Plan, you know, uh, expanding your markets doesn't work when Germany is dirt poor and mm -hmm. paying all its money to, you know, just to rebuild, rebuild. the Soviet Union. Mm hmm you have to have it strong enough, like you said, kind of colonized enough, but still like has enough money to buy your shit. To be a consumer market. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. So it's yeah. not like, oh, we're trying to help you get back on your feet. Like, look how nice we are. It's Well, that's how it was spun. You <laughs> I'm know. sure. I'm but, sure. Um, and there, there were there were elements of that. I don't want to paint them as like purely bad motives, but yeah, it also just so happened to work out that <laughs> it helped them economically. Yeah. All right. So we said the Allied Control Council... It basically starts breaking down because of these disagreements, and it has to work unanimously. Uh, so each occupier basically gets to govern their zone however they want. So right. these zones have to be really small. Well, yeah. I mean, from our American perspective, I guess, yeah. Now, like, we see Germany as a kind of small country. We it's live European. in Texas. Like, we are Germany. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> basically, this ends up gradually breaking the country up into two, uh, into two halves. In June 1945, the Soviet zone allows for the formation of anti-fascist political parties. Good. Uh, and it schedules state elections for October 1946. Great. Uh, and that would be like the different states. Like that's what I'm like, you know, 
uh, like intra elections, I guess. Right, like lo- the, the the state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I see. What you're like saying. governors, you know that sort yeah. of thing. They're just a zone. They're not a country yet. Yeah. Okay. Right. April 1946, uh, the KPD, that's the Communist Party. Mm-hmm. Uh, the SPD, that's the Social Democratic Party, merged mm. to form the Socialist Unity Party, the SED. Okay. I'm curious to hear how the other countries hanging out there like that. They don't. I bet yeah. not. Okay. <laughs> uh, and to be honest, the Social Democratic Party didn't really like it. They were Ooh. basically cajoled, pressured by the Soviets and the Communist Party there. Hey, guys, you better do this. Mm. Um, So they did. Uh, It was billed as a merger of equals, but the communists soon, like, took the leadership positions, basically. And the SED became essentially a communist party, but it was called the Social Unity Party. Okay. All right. In October 1946, they have those state elections in the Soviet zone. The SED wins uh, nearly 50%. Uh, They beat out the... Other political parties there, the Christian Democratic Party, that's like the CDU. Okay. uh, And the LDPD, which is the Liberal Democrats. And, uh, you know, other smaller parties, too. They they lost. Um, So the SED comes out clearly with a lead. Okay, great. January 1st, 1947, the U.S. and the U.K. merged their occupation zones into what was called the buy zone. Mm, that sounds good. It sounds cooler than it is. <laughs> I gotta get the appropriate colored markers for this. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what year and who did this? <laughs> uh, 1947. Okay. U.S. and U.K. Great places. Mm, yeah, I don't know about this. You gotta support oh, it. It's the buy zone. <sighs> no. <laughs> Guys, being bisexual is just Googling what order the colors and the flag are until you die. <laughs> I'm never sure. At this point, I just guess. But everyone has the same problem of that, so it's not like you're a bad. I don't. Th- I think everyone fucks it up. Okay. All right. I'm you you may find yourself kicked out. Maybe. Because of, no. Maybe they'll take away my <laughs> credentials. They're trying. All right. Uh, then in August of the next year, this would become the tri zone when mm. France merged their. All right, we're in a too. polycule now. Yeah, they form a polycule. <laughs> This, this is uh, kind of the first step in building what would become West Germany. June 1948, the Tri-Zone announced a dollar-backed Deutschmark uh, currency mm-hmm. um, that they were going to introduce in Berlin also, into, into West Berlin. Remember, this is what triggered the blockade. Uh, we, well, we said la- the, the Berlin airlift um, where oh, yeah. the Soviets blockade Berlin and yes. then the uh, the Western powers fly in supplies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We said the reason for that was a currency dispute. <laughs> okay, this is the uh, currency This dispute. is the currency dispute. Oh, okay. Uh, the Soviets said this would be bad because it would like hurt their economy. And this was a good prediction because um, it flooded the Soviet zones with like the leftover currency from West Germany. Oh, Okay. That's what the Soviets were still using. So everybody was like, shit, this is worthless here. We're going to bring it over to uh, to East Germany. And, and it just cr- cratered it because there's confusing. just too much money or yeah, floating around. Yeah, you can't have two kinds of money at the same time. Yeah, so they had to introduce the East German mark. Okay. This is, again, part of that building different things here. We already said about the Berlin airlift, how that went. Then in July 1948, the bi-zone, or I guess by now the tri-zone, puts together the Parliamentary Council, uh, formed of the 11 states in those zones, uh, with the goal of preparing a new constitution for Germany. Uh, They worked off of plans that were drawn up earlier in London by the occupying powers. They just kind of like wrote a plan for them and said, hey, you guys, like, you know, do this, this, please. (laughs) These guys, these representatives were appointed by the state governments, the state parliaments. Uh, So they were like, really democratically elected. They just kind of chose a guy. Okay. This is the beginning of forming West Germany. They're, they're drawing up plans for constitution. Uh, Meanwhile, NATO was created April, 1949. The West German zones would have NATO, not NATO troops, but like allied troops or whatever in there till they would themselves join NATO later on. Uh, Then in May, 1949, you have the actual creation of the Federal Republic of Germany. That's West Germany. Here we go. Uh, This was created by the basic law. Basic. Boring. (laughs) 
Well, very offensive to our German listeners. This is still the constitution of modern day Germany. Oh, sorry, Germans. You guys have a basic ass yeah, basic. constitution. <laughs> so this constitution claimed that it was the only legitimate government of Germany altogether. Uh, oh. It was like, we're the we're, coolest. We're the originals. Yeah. Okay. Kind of like how China is, you know, totally in control of Taiwan, you know, if you mm -hmm. ask them, but then Taiwan's like, whatever, we're not. Uh, that sort of a thing. Obviously, the historical circumstances are different, <laughs> but this constitution was ratified by the state parliaments. Okay. They just sent it out to those guys, and it went into effect on May 23rd. Uh, they didn't do any sort of popular referendum on this or anything. They were just like, boom, here it is. Okay, so when they said, hey, we're the only legit constitution for Germany, when they say Germany, were they talking about the whole Germany or just the West part? They were talking, I mean... So they understood that their laws weren't going to go into, into effect in the so Soviet So they, they didn't send that out to the Eastern right. states. Right. They didn't. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys have to listen to us now. But okay. It was implied, and there was a part of it that we'll get to way later. I think it's Article 23 uh, that said, like, this is how we would add new states. Mm -hmm. So okay. they're kind of already prepping okay. in case. So in May 1949, the Soviet zone held elections for a German People's Congress to pass a constitution for East Germany. Okay. Uh, they had been kind of spinning the wheels on this already. This was the third of the People's Congresses, but the other two were kind of like intros. But they had delegates from all these parties and mass organizations meet up to draft a constitution, and so the People's Congress was going to like put that into effect. This process, I thought, was way more democratic. Uh, the constitution got like popular input from people. People got to like propose, hey, add this, hey, add this. Over 90% of these proposals were approved. So it really like was kind of, you know, cobbled together, but in a popular way. So the way this election worked is citizens voted for or against uh, what was called the Democratic Bloc. This would later go on to be renamed the National Front. Okay. Uh, this was like an umbrella alliance of political parties, those anti-fascist political parties we talked about, and also like mass organizations. And what they would do, I mean, in the election, you would you would go up and vote yes or no on the slate of candidates. A little bit Soviet style in that mm -hmm. sense. But within it, you had a lot of different um, kind of flavors of parties. All right. So we already mentioned SED, yes. those guys, Social Unity. Uh, the CDU is the Christian Democrats, the Liberal Democratic Party. Uh, you also had the Democratic Farmers Party, the mm -hmm. DED. The, Demo the, the Democratic Farmers, they were like, uh, well, kind of a farmers representative, representative party. And then you had the NDPD, the National Democrats. They were okay. kind of nationalistic and honestly mm -hmm. created by the SED uh, to do a little bit of outreach to people who used to support uh, the Nazi party. Oh, okay. Weird. Yeah. Um, Not great. Yeah, I, would, I wouldn't repeat that, but that's, I'm gonna write that's what they sus. did. <laughs> <laughs> the SED was a leading party. Like I said, this is kind of like different flavors if, if you're like... You know, oh, I, I identify more as a whatever. It mm -hmm. doesn't super matter because they're still in the same coalition. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But uh, the mass organizations uh, were also a part of the National Front or the, the Democratic bloc at this time. Mass organizations represented different sectors of society. They were kind okay. of part political group, part social organization. Uh, almost everyone in the GDR was in one of these national organizations of some sort. This reminds me of the ones in Vietnam, right? Where they kind of have like the women's group or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It is like that. So you have the Free German Trade Union Federation, uh, which is like a federation of all the trade unions there. You know, it's it's run essentially by the government. Um, so it's it's kind of like a, a company union in that way. Yeah. Uh, but the company is the state and you run the state. The, so it's like... Could be worse. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you also had the Free German Youth. Ooh. This is the youth organization from ages 14 to 25. Uh, before that, you'd be in like kind of the scouts. So it's called the Ernst Tallman Pioneers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, kind of like uh, the young pioneers. I in love the a pioneer. Union. Yes. <laughs> uh, it's the only pioneer I like. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, kind of uh, a communist scouts um, slash social group. Okay. They did a lot. It wasn't just like outdoorsy stuff. Like they did, like they planned, you know, social events and things like that. Cool. Um, it was voluntary, uh, but lots and lots of people did it. It was kind of like to show you're cool, you know, yeah. you would do that. You also had the Democratic Women's League of Germany. Uh, they advocated for women's rights, education, social equality, internationalism, all those good things. 
Uh, you also had the Cultural Association of the GDR, which was like a, a federation of local art clubs. Ooh, sort of. okay. So you could vote for them. You could, you know, kind of say like, I think art, the arts are important, you know, mm -hmm. um, or, and there was the Peasants Mutual Aid Association. Whoa. Uh, they represented peasants, farmers, and gardeners, and they managed and lent out uh, modern equipment for people oh. who got mo who got land through land reform. That's you know, a cool. lot of these guys didn't have. So all these groups take part in the government through these mass organizations, which are all part of the Democratic bloc, later to be called the National Front. Okay. But it's all under the leadership at the top of the SED. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and show you this, and you can pick out which logo Ooh, yes. you like best. Because they're, they're, I think these are cool. Maybe I just, that's my style or something. I'm going to draw the winner. Let's see. Socialist Party. Just some handshaking. I don't like how the flag is so tall. The flag in the background. Oh, okay. I see. It looks kind of dorky. Um, I'm <laughs> sorry. The Christian one is just a little dorky with the dove and stuff. I like the colors, so. though. Uh, the color contrast is going to be a problem there. Hard mm. to read. <laughs> um, loving that big D. <laughs> <laughs> <Are you? laughs> Who doesn't? Um, the farmer's one is a little hard to tell what's going on. It's kind of busy. Yeah. It's like a plow with a wheat thing sticking out of it. Oh, is that a plow? Mm -hmm. Okay. It looked like a medieval heraldry kind of banner, mm. like the, the wheat. I love these leaves, though. Those are cute. Well, that's the uh, the nationalist. Oh, one. no. <laughs> Wait, there's more? Okay, Yeah, great. so these good, are the mass good. orgs. Just more handshakes. That's fine. <laughs> the, the youth one looks very hopeful. Yeah, that's fun. Cool the women's one's boring. Yeah, it's not the best. It's really not good. The cultural one's very modern. I think that one looks like a pharmaceutical company for oh, some reason. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I could see that. Um, the last one looks like a tractor brand. <laughs> John Deere. Yeah, it's just yeah. the color. It's very John Deere. All right. Last group is okay. the uh, smaller organization. They're not mass works, but... <laughs> this one's German-Soviet friendship. What a specific society. <laughs> Ooh, I like their writers association. I mean, that... That logo's been done a million times now, but I bet it was very cutting edge in yeah, 1945. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, the People Solidarity Group looks like a gas station. <laughs> uh, sport and technology. That was the that was the old uh, the elderly. Well, it's the People Solidarity one. Mm, okay, okay. That dove is kind of weird. It looks its wing is messed up. Yeah, <laughs> it's a broken dove. What's Lusitanian or Lusatian? It's like a, a language, mm, okay. like, a, like a, a language federation. They got a good plant kind of logo. Gosh, I think my favorite is still the FDJ or the Big D. The Big D. <laughs> the Big D is just charming. I think I'm going to draw that one. <laughs> That's funny. Those are the liberal Democrats. They're... I know, but they have a good logo. I got to <laughs> give it to them. So uh, they were all, those were all the Democratic bloc people. Yep. Uh, they got there to vote. The ballot said, I am for the unity of Germany mm -hmm. and a just peace treaty. I therefore vote for the following list of candidates for the third German People's Congress. 95.2% of people showed up. 90 what? Five. That's a lot. Yeah. 66% approved of the list. Okay. Uh, so the Congress, you know, they, they were seated. They passed the Constitution of the German Democratic Republic, effective October 7th, 1949. Okay. So now officially you've got two Germanys here. What was the percentage that said yes? 63? 66. Six. Uh, just a side note, like this was 1949 when they got their first constitution. Uh, they would revise their constitution later in their history. Um, they would make a brand new one in 1968. Uh, they did uh, major constitutional changes throughout. In 1958, they uh, abolished their version of the Senate, basically. Which that sounds go good. Them. I would yeah. like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in 1960, they abolished their presidency. Uh, and Talk, just did yeah. like a yeah uh, did did like also. a council of the of the parliament yeah <laughs> these are good um, <laughs> in 1974 they kind of changed up the constitution to make it more separate as opposed to claiming like oh we want to be all of Germany sort of thing okay. it's like now we want to be that's fine our own we can thing. do our own thing yeah and then finally in 1989 when they like just kind of took out the socialist elements oops yeah I don't like that part we'll get to that later too just to just to say like that was in 1949. And they did all those changes in between. And we're sitting here with an old-ass 1789 <laughs> one. It's like, come on, guys. Oh, we really, yeah, we need to do some tidying. 
Yeah. The Constitution set up the Volkskammer, uh, which was the People's Chamber. Okay. As the Supreme Legislative Body, uh, directly elected every four years, 400 members, proportional representation. You had to be 18 to vote and 21 to run. I mean, even those are good things. Yeah, those Direct are kind of nice. elections and uh, what was the other thing that? Like? 400 members. Yeah. To represent that small of a population compared to us. Yeah, you know? that's huge. Oh, the proportional representation, like all that shit. Yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> We're talking around 18 million people. So, yeah, that's that's a good ratio. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they, like I said, they also had uh, their version of the Senate called the Chamber of States or the La- Launderkammer. Okay. They were indirectly elected. And eventually they were like, mm, they suck. Mm, Let's get yeah. rid of them. <laughs> and together, the Volkskammer and the Launderkammer indirectly elected the president. So, you know, they chose the president and you voted for them. So you kind of, you know. Mm, I see, I see. And eventually they were like, that's dumb. That's- Let's get rid of the president. <laughs> yeah, for real. What's the point? Uh, so the Constitution included a lot of rights for people, as most constitutions do. Uh, the right to political participation, voting, running, uh, petitioning the government. Uh, it said all people were equal before the law, including gender equality. Great. Enshrined the right of personal liberty and privacy. Wish we had that. Yeah, that would be good. Um, not an hour. To, I don't know in whose defense, but to qualify that, uh, <laughs> they didn't exactly always follow that right. Yeah, privacy, yeah. It doesn't a big sound like it. Police thing. Um, <laughs> freedom of expression and the press. Freedom from censorship. That's another one that mm. didn't really get followed. The right to unionize. The right to a job. The right to recreation. Annual sick leave and pensions. Ooh, I like recreation. Yeah. Uh, the right to social insurance, talking about health care, mm. old age assistance, motherhood assistance, disability assistance, the right to free public education, the right to housing. Uh, and it stated that its economy was structured on the principles of social justice and the need to provide all people with an existence of human dignity. Uh, it said each person will receive their fair share of production. Uh, it said there would be a progressive income and property tax. Private property and free enterprise could exist, but had to be within those goals of the economy. That sounds very reasonable. Yeah. <laughs> like, even if, like, you still are into capitalism, like, you still fucking do a little bit. Like, that's so reasonable. Yeah, but the government's kind of drawing a line in the sand and saying, you're not going to, you know, mess this whole thing up. Though. Yeah. Like, we reserve the right over. to mess with you if you, you know, cross these lines. Yeah. That was their constitution. Now we've got two Germanys. Let's talk about... Kind of like, what did socialism look like in mm-hmm. the GDR? So one of the big programs they had to do initially was denazification. That sounds like an important one. Yeah. Day one. Uh, you, you know, your, your country just kind of did something really terrible. Mm-hmm. And so you got to deal with it. So in even in the days of the Soviet occupation, right, it's, uh, before 1949, before they formed their own country, uh, you had mass arrests, imprisonments, executions of Nazi war criminals. Yeah. All right. Good. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the During that time, the Soviets started to take apart a lot of East German industry in their zone. So uh, they were like dismantling a lot of the former uh, government run the war factories machine. and stuff. Yeah. yeah. They were taking all that, but they were like taking it away to the Soviet Union as like reparations. Oh, okay. Like uh, basically they wanted... Germany as a whole to yeah. pay ten billion dollars in reparations. That's many dollars. Uh, the West basically wouldn't pay. They paid like a little bit and then immediately stopped. <laughs> so East Germany does end up paying ninety nine percent of this bill. Wow! And it's uh, it's pretty bad for their economy. Yeah, Jesus. Uh, in the Soviets, so to to kind of give you their rationale, not only like repaying for the war, but they're also afraid at this time of Western invasion. They think like. The West gearing up to go attack us again. And if they run right through East Germany, they're going to get all this shit. It's mm-hmm. kind of like how they moved all their factories out east of the Ural Mountains so that Hitler couldn't get to them. Yeah. They're thinking the same thing. Later on, they would actually, like, again, like re dismantle these uh, factories and give them back um, in the 50s once <laughs> Stalin was dead. Okay. Uh, but to get back to the denazification, um, they also confiscated Nazi property uh, without compensation. They were okay. just like, fuck you guys, your land, your businesses, whatever, took it. That's fine. Millions of hectares. Uh, 10,000 Nazi businesses were made public or collectivized. 
They removed 80% of judges, teachers, and government officials uh, for being Nazis or Nazi collaborators. That's fine. So yeah, they, they clean house. Now let us contrast this real quick. We're not going to do this in everything, <laughs> but this is a study in big contrast with West Germany. What did the FRG do? So West Germany, definitely not the same picture. In East Germany, its leaders were communists Yeah. during uh, the war. And before the war, even they were opponents of the Nazis in, really? in, in East Germany and the GDR. I did not know that. Yeah. So these guys, uh, uh, they're the SED's first leader, Wilhelm Pieck, uh, was a Communist Party of Germany member uh, who the Nazis arrested along with Rosa Luxemburg. Uh, he escaped. Uh, he went into exile in the Soviet Union. Uh, their next leader, Walter Ulbricht, uh, was a Communist Party leader in Berlin, uh, where he was kind of a badass. He ordered the assassination of two anti-communist cops in 1931. Uh, he had to go into exile when the Nazis took power. So, you know, the East German leaders actually had credentials as anti-Nazi mm -hmm. communists, right? Uh, their, their final, or their next to final leader, I guess, Eric Honecker, uh, was a Communist Party member in Germany who he actually stayed in Nazi Germany to do like illegal resistance operations Fuck and stuff. Yeah. Uh, he gets arrested by the Gestapo and imprisoned uh, for 10 years before he escapes. So, like, they were actually doing shit. What, were, what, yeah. was, what was the other side doing? West <laughs> Germany. Uh, their chancellor, Konrad Adenauer, was a centrist politician during the rise of the Nazi party, and he wanted to form a coalition with them in the oh, 30s. Oh, cool. Yeah. Later, when he's kind of, like, kicked out of government and stuff, uh, he wrote a letter, a 10-page letter to Hermann Goring, one of the top Nazi guys yeah. uh, in 1934. And he was basically talking up how much he had done for the Nazis as mayor of Cologne. Like, even though he wasn't supposed to, he was like, I, but I helped you guys out in the past. You guys should help me. Oh gosh. That's who they had running their place. His chief of staff was a guy named Hans Globke, uh, who served as chief legal advisor to the office for Jewish affairs oh, in the no. Nazi ministry of interior. Oh no. Yeah. That was headed by one Adolf Eichmann, one of the major architects of the Holocaust. Okay. And these guys are running the government after the war. Those are the guys in charge of West Germany. That's so fucked up. Yeah. Like, how do you even get away with that? Well, it helps that your intelligence service, uh, your like CIA, NSA group rolled into one. Uh, the Federal Intelligence Service, the BND, was set up uh, by the head of the chief of the foreign armies east which was the nazi army's military intelligence service on the eastern front okay. of world war ii that guy reinhard galen after the war with the help of the cia uh set up the galen organization which was this anti-communist intelligence network oh my god and that would eventually morph into the west germany's intelligence service fuck okay literally set up by nazis that's not good <laughs> A study in contrasts. <laughs> yeah, for I mean, like, I think that's really telling. Like, I, I think there's a narrative of of the war in in so that people are like, well, you know, there are some people in America that like the Nazis, and it's like it wasn't just like some people, like some weirdos or something. Like mm -hmm. this was a supported thing. Yes. Like, yeah. It's with, not just a few like racist people with government money. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Um, and this wasn't just a leadership level. Uh, the West Germans, uh, it's in like 19, once they start their own country, they start denouncing denazification. They're just like, that was bullshit. This is just a witch hunt. <laughs> oh my um, God. In 1951, they give amnesty to all but the highest level Nazis. They, they, this is like more than 700,000 people. Jesus. They also banned communists from public service. Cool. So land of the free. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So that's denazification. Um, next up, we have talking about how they collectivized their society, their economy, and how they started industrializing. So remember, they're trying to catch up. Mm -hmm. The Soviets kind of put them in a hole, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. And so they're they're really trying to to rebuild from all that, and they're not getting all the sweetheart deals from the Marshall Plan. Mm -mm. So first up, your favorite land reform. I was just reading about land reform. <laughs> Uh, so remember the Nazis, they got their land expropriated. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do with it? Uh, well, we're going to also add to that land, um, the land from owners of more than one square kilometer. Anyone like that was like the limit. If you okay, had more yeah. than one square kilometer, boom, we're taking the rest. That doesn't seem like very much land. It's, uh, it's like a hundred hectares. Okay. Okay. That's um, a lot of land then. Okay. I, I, so I did the square <laughs> kilometer when it was easier for me to, easier for me to think about. 
It's a one square kilometer is 186 football fields. That's a lot of football fields. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Truly <the> Texan <laughs> measurement. <laughs> yeah, for some reason that clicks with us. <laughs> yeah, so in this way, 33,000 square kilometers were given to more than half a million peasants. 11,000 square kilometers were made public for state farms, for forests, for research institutes. So lots of land. Yeah. All right. They were giving it out to people. They were collectivizing it. You also had 500 estates from the Junkers, which were like nobles, basically, aristocracy. Great. Uh, they took those and they uh, converted them to collective farms. Great. The government also incentivized small farmers who just got these little small plots of land. They were like, hey, um, y'all should join cooperatives. Mm -hmm. We'll make it easier for you to do so. We'll set it up, you know, very little paperwork so that you can pool your resources. Fuck yeah. They also did kind of like the Soviet Union did with those tractor stations and stuff. Like, yeah. let's get you some mechanized stuff. Uh, the government also set up state-owned farms as well. Nice. So through this process, by 1961, what are you talking there? You're talking like 11 years? Mm-hmm. 90% of the GDR's agricultural products were produced on collective or state-owned farms. That's a lot. Yeah, so this wow. was fast, and you didn't see uh, mass famines or any of the other kind of growing pains that you had. Uh, disastrous, we should add, but still uh, in the Soviet Union when they did this. Yeah, yeah, I guess they kind of learned. Yeah, there was also lots of nationalization of industries, banks. Uh, they set up publicly owned enterprises, VEB, because it's in German, about 75% of industries ended up being uh, VEB industries. And by 1960, 91% of industrial production was socialized. So it's a massive transformation of their economy. A little bit more about the economy. It's, you know, kind of the material basis of society. So it's important to know. I've heard this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, initially, they were very heavily focused on heavy industry. Okay. All right. Uh, but they shifted in 1953 to consumer goods to try to produce more of that. It was called the new course. Okay. The reason that they did this was something uh, where basically before that they had been kind of pushing people too hard and they increased work quotas uh, and people didn't like that. Uh -oh. uh, and they did something called the uprising of 1953. Oh, okay. Uh, at first they went on strike, then they demonstrated and then they were outright rising up against the government to try to get them to change this shit. Uh, it was, put down violently by Soviet troops. Oh, no. And so afterward, they were like, okay, well, we're going to do more consumer goods so people aren't so mad at us. Yeah. Uh, and they also set up the combat groups of the working class, which okay. was kind of a the militia arm of the SED. Uh, so that, that one, you know, I think clearly they made a mistake in terms of pushing too hard. Uh, they were probably too violent in their re well the reason they were violent in their reaction is that they waited too long to deal with it mm -hmm. that by the time they got around to saying okay we'll lower the work quotas people were like now we're done with that yeah we, we, we want to get you guys out of there yeah so okay. that was another thing was they responded too slow mm -hmm. to change initially their economy was very centralized central planning all that they did kind of shift with this eventually uh very broad strokes here in 1963 they did the new economic system which which kind of introduced some like more local planning and stuff. Uh, they did say, though, a little bit later, 1968, that, oh, no, we need to actually have some planning in, like, the the key industry, science mm -hmm. and technology and stuff. This was called the economic system of socialism. They always came up with, you know, new names for their <laughs> thing. Uh, this was under a guy named Walter Ulbricht, who was their leader from 1950 to 1971. He was kind of doing these shifts in, you know, oh, we're, we're going to do the new course. Oh, we're going to do the new economic system. What was right? his role? He was the general secretary of the SED. Okay. Uh, the main guy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, once he was out of the picture, uh, the next guy, Eric Honecker, which was 71 to 89, uh, he shifted gears and, and put into place the main task, which was basically this re-refocus on consumer goods again. He's like... <laughs> okay. He's like, Uber got a little crazy there. You know, we were already supposed to be focused on this. Let's get back to it. Let's get back to that. And focusing on standard of living. We want people to have high wages, good welfare plans, good pensions, good housing. I mean, that's good. good. food. You know, we want them to be able to afford things. Yeah, yeah. So there was lots of subsidies on stuff. It wasn't very efficient in that way. Like, mm. you kind of had a lot of waste. You kind of had a lot of 
logistical issues. Yeah, instead of just doing subsidies, why don't, why don't you just give it to people? <laughs> yeah, that's you know, it's that's kind of one of the problems when you're running this kind of market mm-hmm. mix system, uh, and it does get them into a lot of debt as well. Mm. Um, they're always there's kind of always a scarcity of like more luxury or high end goods and imported goods. Okay. For example, one of the commonly cited things is there was a 10 year waiting list to get a new car. Oh wow! Uh, so. People drive I'd be really fine. old I drive the <laughs> shit out of my cars. I yeah, like, drive them to the grave. When you get a new one, you immediately sign up for another uh, Yeah, one. exactly. But some like 70% of families had a car, and it wasn't absolutely necessary mm-hmm. based on where you lived. We'll get into yeah. that too. But let's talk about what was life like at work okay. at the GDR. So first of all, remember, you're guaranteed a job. Uh, workers were always needed. Uh, they were always paid a living wage. Good. God, yeah. more than what we have here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's someone in the documentary said, uh, you know, everyone was giving their time how they could, and everyone's time is valuable. So, you know, duh, like everyone should get paid a good amount, right? It's like the way they were describing it, it was just such, it was the complete opposite of like how here it's like, oh, they're, they're you just should a be burger grateful. flipper. Or, yeah, they're just low skill, or, mm-hmm. you know, all that bullshit. It's like they didn't have that. They saw somebody and they were just like cleaning up the room or something. They didn't think like, why does that guy get paid as much as me, an intellectual? You know, they, they, they thought that person is putting in his time doing that. He should also be paid. Yeah. Yeah. For real. You were also guaranteed a job if you were disabled. Great. Or if you had a criminal record. Great. You were still a person. You still got a job. There was no unemployment. It's, I don't know, it's strange to think about now because we're, we're kind of in the, you know, in this weird phase of the economy where... Oh, nobody wants to work anymore or whatever. Like jobs are plentiful, but many listeners can probably remember times of higher unemployment <laughs> or maybe you've experienced yourself. Like it sucks not being able to provide for yourself. We're not good communists are not like saying it's all about having a job. No, right? no. But that is an important stepping stone to get where we want to get. Mm-hmm. Uh, worker pay versus executive pay. Mm, I love this stat. Ratio. One to three. In which direction? Well, the re- okay, the in the regular direction. The what if it wasn't, direction. though? <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? You just sit in office all day. You get paid a third as much. <laughs> oh, you're just a babysitter, I guess. <laughs> okay, one to three. Uh, what's our current looking ratio? Our current in 2021 was the latest I could dig up. Well, do, do you want to guess? One to 11. Absolutely not. One to 111. Absolutely not. Oh, no. One to 670. Holy shit. (laughs) Yeah. Vastly different. Look. You had unions uh, where you could go speak to your boss. You could get things changed for the better. You had management who would listen to your ideas. And you had the job security to go talk to them in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to. So what? What if they don't like what you say and they fire you? You have a right to a job. Mm Mm-hmm. You can go get hired somewhere else. It was A, hard to fire you in the first place because you had a union. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. There were protections in place for that. It would just be great to have that sort of, you know, ability to be comfortable speaking your mind to try to improve the place that you spend like a third of your life in. If they didn't listen, you could file a grievance with the union and it had to be addressed within two weeks. That's great. You could report your boss for corruption. Fuck yes. And they would get fired instead of, you know, them firing you for whistleblowing and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like actual being able to participate like that. You also got to participate in the bigger picture, economic planning for the whole country. Mm -hmm. Uh, So workplaces kind of, the way it worked, they would send data up to the government. The government would sit down, the SED, you know, they'd sit down and they'd they'd set the goals. They'd draft out a plan based on all all the inputs. And then they'd send that out to all the political parties, the mass organizations, the workplaces. Say, what do you guys think? You know, and then the workplaces, you know, the steel industry would be like, y'all ask too much of us. We can't do that. It's got to mm. be lower. Or uh, the farmers would be like, hey, actually, our crop's going to be a lot more than that. You might want to put that into the plans. You know, they could make changes, make recommendations, and then send that back to the government to combine it all to make the final draft. And that would be the budget. That's so cool because, like, such a common complaint of government is, you know, all these are all people who don't know what I do as a worker or what, mm-hmm. you know, they don't actually know about farming, but they're making farming bills, shit like yeah. that. Yeah. And th- in- instead, now you have this transparent way to actually, you know, you can look in the bill and be like, oh, hey, I did that. I did that. Can you imagine? <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Affecting change? What? Yeah, insane. 
And and to me also imagine giving a damn mm -hmm. about it because mm -hmm. like right now why do I want to make the economy better to make more money for my boss? No, but this <laughs> is like yeah, let me make the economy better so I can have more nice things. Yeah. Like yeah, sure. <laughs> Large workplaces had childcare and healthcare facilities on site. Oh. Uh, even sometimes they had shops uh, or they were very nearby. People after reunification complained. Uh, they were like shocked that you couldn't like leave your job during the day to go take care of errands and stuff. <laughs> They're like, what? You want me to stay here the whole day? What the fuck? <laughs> I mean, as someone who works from home, I got to say, it's pretty sweet. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I miss it. Workplaces also covered your gym membership. Nice. Uh, this was the German Gymnastics and Sports Federation, um, one of those mass organizations. They organized and funded all the sports and fitness activities in the GDR. Nice. And that was just covered through your work. That was, you know, no extra money, nothing. And another kind of caveat here is it's like, in our society, we don't want childcare and healthcare, all these things, to be tied to your job because your job is cutthroat, mm -hmm. you know, and you might lose it if you go to another one. But here, there's zero unemployment. Yeah. So you could just go get another one that also has all those things. Yes. That's what I mean. It's like, <laughs> there's nothing at risk. You know, yeah. It's fun. And your boss is not so much a, a, a rapacious asshole mm -hmm. who's like repeatedly exploiting you. Whether or not they're a good person, class-wise, they are exploiting you. You know, that, that's not the case. They're just like a person with a management job. Yeah, yeah. You know, they're there to, you know, coordinate things, but they're not like going back and going back to the mansion or whatever. Yeah, they're you know? not making I mean they are making more money than you, but not they're not making know, more money off of you. times more. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not yeah, it's not a direct exploitation as as much. Yeah, it's the importance of social And you can fire them if you really don't like them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. <laughs> uh the the trade union that that FDGB, mm -hmm, that big boy. the big one, yeah. Uh they helped workers arrange their vacation bookings. Nice. And you would actually take vacations. Oh. Um, not uh, not like a, a day you know, like a day off. <laughs> the I day mean, to like go a, to the dentist? Yeah, like a vacation vacation <laughs> goes somewhere, you know? Wow. Um, around 80% of citizens in the GDR reported going on vacation at some point in the year. Uh, I bet our stat's way lower. <laughs> yeah, I didn't look, bother to look that <laughs> Okay, up. yeah. It was widespread and, wow. and easy to do and affordable. Now, earlier we mentioned they had the child care and health care facilities there. Mm -hmm. So about health care, uh, universal, free, equal health care for all. Fuck Yes. Super accessible in terms of transportation. So more like connectivity, right? Mm -hmm. uh, centered on workplaces or neighborhoods. They also built dedicated rural facilities for healthcare as well to make sure to not leave people out. Good. They also did a lot of elderly outreach um, to make sure that people, you know, weren't getting left left out of the system in, in that regard either, uh, which is something they didn't have after reunification when public transit and everything is is left to the private companies that don't care yeah. if they get out to elderly people. Reproductive health care, of course, is health care. Uh, so they gave free contra contraception. Great. They legalized and had free uh, first trimester abortions. Great. After that, of course, they had exceptions for life health, uh, including mental health uh, of the mother. Great. They didn't just have on demand. They had on demand in first trimester. Okay. Uh, all right. That's health care. Like it? I do. <laughs> I'd be into all of this. I mean, I'd like more abortions, but it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was like the 50s. So Yeah, that's really intense for the 50s. <laughs> <laughs> all right, housing. We love housing. Housing guaranteed for all in the Constitution. Uh, built more than 3 million units of housing. Uh, people who appeared not to be housed, uh, you know, if you were found in the street or something like that, were like just pretty much immediately interviewed. Either workers from the government or just regular people would go and figure out, hey, what is up? Like, yeah. are you okay? Do you need something? Yeah. And they would help you like go to the government agents and, and, and get you housed immediately. Holy shit. That was just not a thing. Wow. Yeah. How much do you think you're paying for rent? Percent of income. Percent of income. Okay. I'm bad at this. So like, I know when you apply for an apartment, you're supposed to do like a third of your income, which is fucking hilarious. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because um, it's impossible. <laughs> What do you mean? Is it it's supposed to be a third of your monthly income goes to rent or mm -hmm. less. Okay. And like nobody can do that anymore. So most people rent is so afford, high. Uh, most people pay more than that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's say ten percent of your income. Half that. Five. Five percent of your income. That's like you're paying like just nothing. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So this one guy in the documentary talked about his his first apartment that he got in 1989. It was a 300 square foot unit. This is like a small That's New York small. City studio yeah. sort of thing. 
But I, I watched the video. Like, they had everything in there, you know? Like, yeah. it, was, it was fine. He wasn't specific on the currency unit that he was using. I think it was the GDR mark. But it, I guess it could have been. I ran both, just to, in case. He was, for some reason, using West German marks. <laughs> I ran the calculation of the conversion at that time and then the inflation conversion. All right? So if he was, for some reason, using the West German mark, he was paying $24 in rent. A month? Yeah. Now... If he, more likely he was using the East German mark, he was paying five dollars and fifty four cents today oh in rent. God, five dollars. And she's like, "What? It's fine. That's Boom. nothing." Yeah. <laughs> so it's essentially free. Yeah, it's it's not a cost that you're thinking. About, yeah, yeah. You know? uh, it's heavily subsidized to be able to get to that point. And th th again, their goal is not making money off of housing; it's providing housing to people. Uh, housing units were managed by resident associations. Uh, who like worked together to maintain the place. You had like uh, seasonal like yard work days. Everybody would go out and Aww. do the yard work for the building. And then you'd have like a little block party afterward. That's um, cute. Yeah. It, it was like less atomized, more communal. Less, less naggy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think it's interesting because you had all sorts of walks of life, like doctors, manual laborers would just live in normal apartments. Mm -hmm. you know, not so stratified. Yeah, yeah. So um, I just went to Norway, and I was very impressed by like the the bus system there. Literally, everyone uses it. I saw like students. I saw like kind of wealthy looking people. Like any mm -hmm. kind of person uses it, and yeah. like because it's nice and it's easy and it's on time. Like it was just it was very impressive. Yeah, that's a different sort of society, and I found it strange. There was a lady talking about it in the documentary. Because she's living, you know, after reunification, she's talking about like, yeah, we just, you know, we had so much more community. Mm. You would talk to people that you lived with. You knew the people who lived in your building. Oh my gosh. Can and, you imagine? <laughs> yeah. And it's like, and she's, you know, kind of lamenting that no one does that anymore. Yeah. And I was, I was thinking like, how kind of messed up is it that I don't like, in, on a personal level, I guess I don't really want that because I've been raised in a society where I don't want to be around people like i'm mm -hmm. afraid of them and and all this like like i kind of wish i could have those sorts of feelings like i kind of yearn for community but kind of also don't yeah you know? but you also have to consider like what were the factors that led me to not want that mm -hmm. and it's it's you know we grew up on stories like oh well, there's a murderer out there and yeah. like everyone's out to get you that kind of thing so yeah that's a product of our society yep uh, they had a similar idea of urban planning to the Soviet Union, very localized, uh, like we were saying, reliant on public transit uh, or just walking, and very walkable. Hell yeah. Uh, they, they did have some downsides, like the best housing units were pretty scarce. All right? Those were mostly reserved. Like those would go, priority would go to like families with uh, larger families. Mm -hmm. uh, they would also get like the more modern units with more modern amenities. And you might get stuck with kind of an old clunker. You might have to do a lot of like home repair and shit on your own. Mm, okay. Um, but, uh, and, and getting supplies to do that was sometimes hard. It wasn't expensive. Yeah. It was just hard to find. Okay. So that, those, those were some of the downsides to it. Yeah. I mean, I'd argue if you have like six kids, you probably need a washing machine or whatever <laughs> those conveniences were. <laughs> yeah. Or like just, I mean, but you would have like a laundromat mm -hmm. super nearby and stuff. You yeah. Know, like so. Uh, women. Love those guys. <laughs> <laughs> They're great. They're um, cool. Equality was guaranteed in the Constitution, like we said. Mm -hmm. Women's emancipation was seen as central to building a scientific socialist society. Yeah, yeah, it is. it is. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. Uh, we talked about the mass org of the Democratic Women's League of Germany, representing women's interest in government. Uh, by 1959, 40% of college students were women. Wow. Uh, they... Would, uh, would kind of build on that as they went. I mean, uh, in contrast, at the time, we only had like two women in college or something like that. You know, yeah, it in was the not 50s, common yeah. in the 50s. Uh, they liberalized divorce laws. Great. Uh, women, Always good. Women could divorce husbands for hindering their career. <laughs> you held me back. <laughs> yeah. Contrast. Love it. In West Germany, before 1977, married women couldn't work without their husband's permission. Cool. And even then... Husbands could kind of rescind that permission if domestic duties suffered. <laughs> okay, great. So, the opposite. Yes. <laughs> uh, by 1988, half of judges, workplace representatives, and students were women. Wow. I mean, we don't have that. 
Yeah. No, no, we don't have that. (laughs) We don't. Uh, By 1989, 91.3% of women were in the workforce more than any other country in the world. Yeah. Yeah. That's a fuck time. Another little factoid I found interesting, I was reading about this person's work. Uh, Anthropologist Kristen Godsey Mm -hmm. uh, argues that women had better sex under socialism. Fuck yeah. She cited surveys in which GDR women reported having twice as many orgasms as FRG women. Hell yeah. (laughs) Getting it. And, you know, I've read some interviews with her and everything and and op-eds by her. She, She was saying that basically she could attribute this to greater economic autonomy, social equality, and greater social welfare provisions, like having basically having more time to enjoy life's pleasures instead of focusing on toiling to survive. Yeah, yeah, you got more time. Good sex can take a minute. You have the ability to leave if you're not compatible with somebody. Mm-hmm. Like, that's a big deal. And you're not trying to find time to be intimate with someone who is like dominating, you, mm-hmm. like, who, who is like kind of oppressing you in your own home. Yeah, you know? yeah. You're not put upon. Yeah. So, I I don't know. I I thought that was a cool little angle, too. (laughs) And basically, this all gets rolled back after reunification. They say, no more good sex. (laughs) They take away all the vibrators. Well, yeah. You know, you no longer (laughs) have that economic autonomy. And so, you're... I saw some interviews where kind of like older women and stuff were saying like my daughter like she, she just is always working she's just ne- never you know she does a date or you know, these things like that you know this was in, in kind of those early years they've i'm sure addressed things more since then but it's just i don't know that was a that is interesting a weird angle of it yeah because you you maybe culturally would think the stereotype the stereotype is. of being like oh well women in the workforce or this is a very retrograde stereotype obviously of like oh well they're they're sexless they're feminists they they don't mm. want it you yeah. know so like it's funny to me it's like no they have it it's just better yeah <laughs> and they have the, the the freedom they enjoy to, it now <laughs> yeah exactly and part of that we said was the social welfare provisions like child care and education yeah you know, you're yeah. freed up from that uh so speaking of which starting from before the kid is born Half a year of paid maternity leave while pregnant. Half a year. Good Lord. I'd do some unspeakable things for that. Then you get a lump sum payment. For a baby? Yeah. You get paid around a month's wages, uh, about a thousand marks. Nice. Boom. That's for the first kid. If you have your second kid, you'll get paid 1500 Damn, okay. Third kid, 2500 and 7500 thereafter. So they really want you to pump them out. Yeah, they're like, please, <laughs> please give us the babies. Yeah. And that's a lump sum. And then you get a year of paid leave. Oh, my God, a year. <laughs> oh. You, know, you get half a year off while pregnant. Then they pay you. Then they pay you to stay home. You also got 20 days off of work a year to take care of your kids if they were ill. If you were a shift worker, you got 30. And I bet they also have great child care facilities. So you probably don't even have to use those days that much. Yeah. I figured. <laughs> Free <laughs> child care. <sighs> Free child care, including breakfast and lunch. Nice. These were in state-run creches. I'm not sure if I'm saying that. It's got a little accent on it. Mm, so yeah. Creches? I don't know. I have no idea. I thought you might with, you know, <laughs> sojourning in France and everything. It looked <laughs> like a French the same word. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's like a pre-K daycare okay. little thing. Uh These were provided within walking distance of residential blocks or, like we said, sometimes on-site at work. Fuck yes. So, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., kids watched ages 1 to 3. Uh, 85% of GDR parents could work outside the home because of this. Yeah. Not just, like, the convenience factor of it, but, like, that's beneficial to kids. I mean, getting to, like, interact with other kids and stuff at that age. That's huge. We're we're social creatures. Yeah, yeah. That's how you learn to be a human. Yeah. Then you move up from there. You move up to kindergarten. Uh, That's what it's called because it's German. (laughs) Uh, Ages four to six. Uh, Again, with free and universal no paying here. It's it's the first compulsory part of the education. They also moved up kindergartners, like they moved teachers up with them. So like you'd have the same teacher. Oh, okay. That's that supposed to be group. really good for especially young kids. Yeah. I, I think I would not like to do it, but <laughs> maybe. Then he would be off to the Polytechnic Secondary School from age 7 to 16. Class sizes. Oh uh, gosh, give me these. They averaged less than 19 oh my God. in the 70s. In the 50s, they had whopping 26. 26. I would love that. Yeah, for Mm -hmm. real. My largest ones uh, in my current district, anyway, are like 28. I've had 30 temporarily, but... That's too many fuckers to keep track of. Yeah, it's it's 
tangibly worse. <laughs> 19 would be heavenly. Yes, definitely. Uh, the way it was structured was kind of interesting, I thought. Um, you had like compulsory lessons in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in the afternoon, you had electives. Nice. Uh, study groups, projects, sports. So it was like a cool way to break up the day, I thought. I like that, yeah. From the seventh year on, that's from when you're 13 to 16, uh, you'd visit a factory or power station or farm, some sort of workplace mm. uh, once a week, four hours, you know, of your of your school day to kind of get to see how they do the work, maybe even practice some kind of once Love you're older, that. you got to get like interning almost, you know? Very cool. Uh, yeah. Like you get to see maybe kind of like broaden your interests, you know, figure out if like you really do want to do that or not. Um, and also I think gain like respect for all these different types of professions. Definitely. You know? and, and school can be so abstract, you know, like why the fuck am I learning trigonometry? And so like being able to like go out there and start figuring out what you're actually interested in, what you should focus on. That's really cool. Yeah. Uh, after Polytechnic, you'd branch off to either vocational training or university. Again, all free. Like we said, school was kind of seen as a practical training for being able to work, to contribute however you could to society. It had an emphasis on cooperation on group work, solidarity, mm. uh, less of like competing as an individual and more as like cooperating as a class. Like we all succeed together. Sort I of love thing. that. Yeah. Uh, you also had local youth sports clubs all free. Mm. So you could go play soccer or whatever. Great. Um, and like we said, the, the free German youth, that mass org. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they had something called friendship brigades. <laughs> Which was okay. super cute sounding. Uh, they're they're kind of like socialist missionary groups or like Habitat for Humanity type things. Except, okay. Uh, you know, except for like instead of, you know, going on a very, very useful mission trip to Universal Studios or some <laughs> shit, uh, you would go to like the Global South and help train them to use equipment that the GDR had given them to like develop their economy. That's really stuff. cool. Yeah. So instead of, you know, doing basically colonization 2.0 <laughs> and, <laughs> and evangelizing about a religion, mm -hmm. you are like tangibly helping them and helping them like help themselves later and not be dependent. Like that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. For real. All right. Last of the life and GDR section, uh, is kind of a miscellaneous, okay. uh, couldn't really come up with a good category here. LGBT rights, 1956, they decriminalized homosexuality a little late, I guess, but maybe earlier than a lot of places, the queer community in the GDR still did experience like social discrimination. Yeah. It was still, it wasn't like the norm or accepted. Okay. Uh, really. And then, you know, there was, there was a lot of exclusion in that way. It was not a government thing or any, like, you know, like it just that. was social. Yeah. Okay. So it's not good, but at least they decriminalized it in 1956. So mm -hmm. that, that was, that was good. Uh, and then later they do turn the page on that and they do make it more of a government policy to like, to increase like tolerance and, and acceptance and things like that. Cool. But that's like later. That's like the 80s. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, religion. Uh, the leadership of the GDR, they're a Marxist-Leninist party, the SED is. Uh, they're atheists. Okay, yeah. Figured. They're leading a country that was 85% pot Protestant and 10% Catholic in 1950. Wow, I didn't realize it was that Protestant. That's well, Martin Luther came from there. No, so. that's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, from the beginning, there was like cooperation slash outreach to Christians in the form of the CDU, the Christian mm -hmm. Democratic Party. The one with the dove. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but over the years, they kind of changed tactics. So for a little while there, they were like pretty harsh. Uh, they were they were just completely frowning on Christianity. The church would complain about various things like uh, the youth group. They had like a kind of a, a communist uh, um confirmation ceremony, a coming of age ceremony. <laughs> I love it. Uh, and, you know, of course, the the uh, the churches were like, ah, oh, that's, you know, don't do that, you know, and oh. complaining about it. And they were just like, whatever, we're doing it. Like, who cares? <laughs> uh, and kind of over time, Christianity dwindled in the GDR and both of them started being nicer to each other. Uh, okay. So the church finding itself in such a weak position was like, I guess we got to like try to find a way to work with the government yeah, so we can keep what members we have. Because it sucks right now. If you're a religious person, you're getting excluded from all these things. You know, mm -hmm. and we don't want that because people keep leaving us for that reason. So, mm -hmm. on the other side, the government was like, "You guys are chumps. You know, you guys are not strong enough to be our <laughs> rivals anymore. So we're going to be nicer to you because we don't need to stop you." Okay. By 1989, 70 percent of GDR citizens were non-religious. That's so many. Wow. A big change from before. Yeah. 
Uh, they also, in terms of culture, had mo the most theaters per capita in the world. Oh my gosh, I needed to go there. <laughs> the most orchestras per capita in the world. They had 168 orchestras, all publicly funded. Uh, they had three times more live music performances than in the than in West Germany. Holy shit! Uh, they had state-owned TV, radio, and a film industry called DEFA. The interesting thing I thought about the film industry, one thing that I read about them is uh, they made something called Austerns, which are like Ost is East um, mm. in German. So it's, it was a play on words for a Western. Oh, that's cute. <laughs> so they made their own Westerns. Um, that's adorable. Like, like a spaghetti Western, but, but Eastern. <laughs> yeah. But I, th I thought the really cool thing here was that they kind of flipped the scripts with their Westerns. Ooh, because it's always about like tough guy, individual man. Fighting. Fighting natives. Yeah. They flipped the script. The natives were always the heroes in theirs. Fuck they yes. were fighting to protect their land, fighting against like, you know, imperialists coming in and, and, and encroaching on the, or the, or the military or whatever, you know, it was, it was like reversed. Okay. Super cool. Uh, listeners, if you have any sources for where to watch this, please <laughs> let me know. Now one, I guess now we would say problematic. They probably wouldn't have thought of it really is that they were using like Yugoslavian actors and yeah, stuff to portray natives. Yeah. So they were doing a little bit of <laughs> whatever face that would be, but they didn't think of it at the time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Now, in, in terms of, we're talking about the arts and stuff like that, there was censorship. Mm -hmm. So one of the criticisms is, oh, there was censorship. And yeah, that did totally happen. Live performances were like surveilled by the government and stuff. And scripts had to be read in advance and foreign films couldn't be too like pro-capitalist or whatever. That was a thing. Their, their state run TV stations, radio stations, those were filtered through, you know, a party lens. You couldn't put anything out there that they would consider subversive. Mm -hmm. That was a thing. That kind of sucks. Yeah. Um, they said, you know, we got to protect our people and all that. But, you know, you're common refrain to that. Do better. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> sports for all you sports heads out there. East Germany was very successful in international competition, mm. like in the Olympics and shit like that. Okay. It was kind of bad, though, um, because for a long period of their history, from 1972 to 1988, uh, they were running a state-sponsored doping program. Okay, that's not great. Yeah, so that was a big scandal when people found that out. All right, speaking of which, let's get into the drawbacks and shortcomings section. Room for improvement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we talk, We mentioned already the Stasi. The, yeah. This was the Ministry for State Security. Their motto was the shield and sword of the party. Is that two S's or one? One S. So, I mean, you know, one at the beginning, one in the middle. That's yeah. what I mean by that. The Stasi was set up in 1950, so after the West Germans set up their, you know, their own little Nazi CIA group over mm -hmm. there. Um, so it was in reaction to that. Uh, like we said, it's a secret police slash intelligence force, so they did like mean things. That's bad. Yeah, you know. generally. You can't um, have a good one of those. They targeted saboteurs. They targeted foreign agents, corrupt officials, anti-government activists. Uh, they did a large-scale surveillance program of... The populace. I mean, think like a manual version of the NSA in that terms sucks. of mass, you know, mass surveillance. They did this directly through spies or through informants. They had more than 100,000 informants who kind of worked with them to surveil like their neighbors and shit. Um, they literally had Stasi officers posted to each major industrial plant to kind of keep an eye on things. Uh, they had spies in apartment buildings to report on people's comings and goings. Uh, they had infiltrated school organizations to make sure no one was subverting there. Overall, they arrested around 250,000 people who were considered political prisoners. And then in the 70s, they developed a technique called Zersetzung, which was kind of like just psychological harassment. Okay. Uh, just kind of fucked with them without them knowing it was the Stasi. So they wouldn't arrest them. They would just be like, you would feel like you're being watched. Right. Like or that. like they break into your house and like move Just things around oh, oh, or they oh. you know yeah they, they were trying to like basically gaslight you or make you think everything was falling apart that sucks uh, yeah pretty crazy I mean it isn't as violent I would say <laughs> so there's that you're Thanks not in not jail for not shooting up my apartment yeah. I really appreciate it you know, but, but it really did mess with people I mean people did commit suicide over that that's um, fucked uh, so yeah I mean they were mean guys doing mean things okay the only I guess context or whatever that I can offer is that the A, other countries do this too. I mean, that's a toss throwaway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but B, they were doing it to, in their view, to protect a society with ideals that I agree with more. That's yeah. kind of also a weak, a weak defense. But that's, I mean, that's how I would, 
That's the best way I can put it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm not into this. Yeah. No, yeah it's, no. it's, it's, <laughs> I can't I can't think of a way to say that besides that. I'm not you can into make it. it a strike. That's fine. That's a strike for me. Here, I'm gonna I'm gonna write in red. Yeah. Strike one. Man, they've only gotten one strike though so far. Did they get yeah, I guess I guess that's it so far. Here, here we go. Next one, though, maybe. The Berlin Wall. Okay, yeah, what's about this wall? Well, this was actually called the Anti-Fascist Protection Rampart. That's a much better name. It's a cool name, yeah. <laughs> yeah. This was in 1961, built around West Berlin. Very mean, right? Why did mm -hmm. they do that? So one is the official explanation. Uh, the CIA and the Nazi-founded BND, the, the West German intelligence group, uh -huh. they were doing sabotage. Okay. And we do have some documentation of them actually doing sabotage. <laughs> Okay. Uh, they were damaging power stations, shipyards, public buildings. They were derailing freight trains. Uh, they would fuck up factory machinery. Uh, they did a weird one where they poisoned 7,000 dairy cows. Fuck. Uh, they also put soap and powdered milk meant for schools. Uh, Fuck. Yeah. They set off some stink bombs at political meetings. That was... <laughs> it sounds kind of funny, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it doesn't mean it's okay, but it's at least a little bit funny. But they were being assholes, right? So the theory here was like, we got to make our border more secure so that these guys can come be assholes. That was the official explanation. Okay. It was not the primary reason they were doing it. Oh, okay. And I, I do think it factored in, but the primary reason, the more crucial explanation uh, was that people were leaving. People, mm. West Berlin was aggressively bribing. East German citizens uh, to defect. Oh, no. They were, you know, just, you know, for one, offering higher wages and stuff without telling you, like, you're going to also have to pay for all this shit. Yeah, you won't <laughs> have health care and child care and doctors and et cetera at yeah. your workplace. <laughs> but they were also providing, like, interest free loans, fancy apartments, immediate citizenship, and compensating them for any property left behind. Okay. So they were really trying to sweeten the pot. Why? They needed workers? Uh, they were basically just trying to fuck with the GDR. Oh, and yeah, okay. you, you would get more workers and stuff, sure. Uh, but um, the GDR lost 10% of its population to West Germany in its first 10 years. So this was a well, big a deal. It's a lot, yeah. Um, but it wasn't everybody. That's, that's not most of the population. Most of the population staying. Uh, the worst part here, though, was the what we call the brain drain. Mm, okay, okay. All we mean here is that highly educated professionals, where did they get this education? In free East German schools, mm -hmm. uh, would take that blessing, they would crumple it up, and they would go sell out to West Germany <laughs> where they could make, make way more money buying fancier things. Right? And once you get to that point, you know, once you're, if you get educated enough to, to get one of those high paying jobs in a capitalist society, then the whole thing about like, I'm getting paid more, but I have to pay for more shit is not as problematic because no, it's, it's like a still 5% of your income. Yeah, it's a smaller percentage. Uh, okay. Yeah. So that's why it was wealthy people doing that more mm -hmm. so than regular working people. Okay. Or I should say would be wealthy people. Remember, they're making like, th what, three times as much as people here <laughs> instead of hundreds of times more. So that was a big problem. It was fairly selfish. I get why people would want to do it, you know, and, you know, if you know people who had done that or whatever, like, I get it. I get it. It just, from the government's point of view, and thereby from the broader population, it was really causing problems. Yeah, I, I would say, I don't know, I, I struggle with that because I, mm -hmm. I get it, but at the same time, it's like, you you have you have a pretty good, <laughs> I mean, yeah. like, I don't, I don't get the need to accrue that much more because, you know, a lot of times I think people's argument for accruing wealth is, is well, I want to take care of future generations. Like, well, they'll still be taken care of in, in socialist state too, you know, yeah. like they're going to get <laughs> all these things. They won't if you leave and, you know. Mm -hmm. But it's part of what know. we say about the boot is wet is that people are still living in a, in, with a capitalist mindset a yeah, lot of, in yeah, a lot of ways. Definitely. On the night of August 13th, 1961, the GDR police and army go and, and close off the border. They kind of tear up a bunch of roads that are connecting to it. And they install a barbed wire fence around West Berlin. Okay. It's called like Barbed Wire Sunday or something in their history. Uh, and they go on to, over the next months, build the wall itself. But they initially close it down, boom, no more going back and forth. Uh, so this is all around West Berlin, which, remember, is surrounded by larger East Germany. The Berlin Wall stood from 1961 to 1989. Over that time, around 100,000 people tried to escape it. Around 5,000 succeeded. And around 200 people were killed. Okay. I thought that number would be higher. I did too. Like, it's always portrayed as like 
families got massacred well, on the yeah, wall. My, my imagination of it was always the way I, the received history I got, right, was like, I can picture maybe a movie scene or something where it's like, you know, someone's trying to escape, they get shot down, and you see maybe someone else watching and they're like, another one. You know, mm-hmm, like, mm-hmm. it seems like it's so commonplace. <laughs> but it, and it, and it sucked. I mean, like, I mean, uh, yeah, that still sucks. The down, you know, the, the, the way to think about this is even if it doesn't happen very often, if it happens 1%, if it happens to someone you know, then that's 100%. Exactly. You know, it's, exactly. it's still devastating. Uh, while there were travel restrictions at this point, you had to get approved to cross over into West Berlin or over into West Germany uh, or anywhere else. You had to get approved by the government. Uh, these restrictions weren't absolute. People definitely got permission to travel. Many did, and they didn't, and they came back. They didn't defect. Uh, so that totally happened. I mean, even before the wall went up, thousands of East Berliners were working in West Berlin and coming back every day. Yeah, yeah. You know? um, so it's not to say that, like, you also get this picture of, like, everyone was trying to leave, mm-hmm. and then they put up a wall so they couldn't. It's not that. I mean, there were a lot of people trying to leave, but it wasn't the majority. Yeah, okay. a lot. It was a small minority. All right, so are you going to give the wall a strike? So... What I had heard about it through just pop culture and stuff is that it, like, separated people and mm. it was, like, very tragic, I guess. Yeah. Is that true? Uh, I would basically, I would say yes with qualifications. Okay. So, one of my, I guess one of my pet peeves of history is how exaggerated things are sometimes, you mm-hmm. know, and, and what, like I said, are received history in the West. Uh, because families, while they were separated by the wall... Uh, still could visit each other. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, thousands, uh, tens of thousands probably, of, of East German families got to visit their West German families and vice versa, like each year, annually. That was fine. Uh, that happened a lot. They would just go get approval. You know, it was less convenient. Mm-hmm. You know, you had to get approval. And that comes with some restrictions, right? The, the approval means that there could be disapproval. Mm-hmm. So... In that way, it's bad because it kind of restricts what you can do. Like, should I speak out about this? Maybe I won't get to visit my family. You know, that's kind of bad. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, But it wasn't... It wasn't total. For most people, yeah. For most people, it wasn't the case like, oh, I got separated from my family. I didn't see them again until 1990. Yeah, yeah. That wasn't the case, usually. It was a pain in the ass, but you could do it for the most part. But I think it did kind of constrict people in in that way, is that that could be held over them. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. I don't want, you know... I, I do think it was bad in that regard. I just don't think it was as cartoonishly bad. As yeah, I, th- I think that is how it's often shown as this this horrible example of, of totalitarianism or something. Mm-hmm. When it's doesn't seem like... I mean, it's not good, don't get me wrong. Yeah. yeah. I'd rather we didn't have to. Yeah, I think that that would be uncomfortable just to have that restriction. But I don't know. It's, it's hard to, to imagine just because like, we live in a society where like it's very normal to live far away from your family so like it's not a huge you might only see your family once a year anyway you yeah, know that's true that's and there true. are restrictions now i gotta go take off my shoes or whatever and go through security so yeah. that's a thing yeah and i mean governments do travel restrictions in a lot of ways yeah you know so i don't know i don't i don't think it was good or definitely something that we should try to repeat in the future mm-hmm. um, i don't think it's worthy of condemning the whole society i don't either uh, but not good yeah i know all right. Next, we mentioned before, but uh, they were they, they basically had economic shortages and problems, especially in consumer goods. Okay. Uh, and they really don't ever fully fix that. They're import dependent for their whole time. You didn't have many luxury goods. You certainly didn't have you know all the you know towering wealth of, of the West, and this really frustrated people. Um, people kind of always looked to. West Berlin and West Germany and the West broadly, like enviously, you mm-hmm. know, like I wish we could have those things. Yeah. You know, in, in their mind, they meant, I wish I could have those things within, you know, all the things that I am getting. In addition to. Yeah. yeah. But they didn't really see how those were incompatible. Like um, one would ruin the other. <laughs> uh, but that, that's, that's a problem that leads to, you know, unrest later. And what one good example of this is the coffee crisis. Okay. I mean, I'd be in a crisis if I couldn't get my coffee. Dude, you would be in a crisis here. So, <laughs> 1976, uh, there's a big shortage of coffee because there's a failed harvest in Brazil. And they import 100% of their coffee, right? So, they have to figure out how the hell are we going to get coffee. It was super popular uh, mm-hmm. in Germany overall. 
uh, drinking coffee. And so, so they, they had the shortage. Uh, they're trying to figure out what to do to get people their coffee because they're just like barren shelves, right? Mm. Uh, so they, st- they start producing something called coffee mix, Uh-oh. Uh, which was 50% coffee and 50% like filler, like chicory, beans, and grains. Oh, okay, chicory is like a traditional mm. beverage, though. Yeah, but it's, it's doesn't not taste the same as coffee. <laughs> um, so people, you know, derided the government for this. They're oh. like, you guys suck. You're giving us this crappy coffee. Uh. So that, you know, just made them unpopular. Mm-hmm. It, it, it lost public confidence in, in them doing their jobs. I don't see a really good way around that. Their, yeah. their strategy, what they did was they started uh, giving a whole bunch of equipment and stuff to Vietnam. Mm. And they said, you guys... Uh, you guys want to grow us coffee? Yeah, start growing coffee, please. <laughs> you, like, basically, you can pay us back for this equipment by giving us coffee. Yeah. Problem is, coffee tastes like eight years to yeah. uh, harvest. And so they like were not around by the time that the coffee thing... <laughs> That's embarrassing. Came to. Yeah, so... Okay, doesn't everyone, except for countries that produce coffee... Like, the United States has to import like all of its coffee, right? There's right, no way. The United States can pay more money than you can. So when there's a shortage, mm, right, okay. capitalism solves it by just saying, well, the prices are up. Yeah, yeah. You know, so only the rich people get it. And we exploit the fuck out of those countries, too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the U.S. can show up with guns and say, you're giving <laughs> us the coffee. Yeah, including Hawaiian coffee that we'll, we'll just take. <laughs> yeah. The last thing I have in the shortcoming section is party stagnation. Okay, what's that? I mean, so, I know what it is. Well, but. <laughs> politically, we talked about there's not that many options. Like, you have the kind of flavors of, you know, pick your favorite design. But, like, mm-hmm. they're all in the same umbrella organization. Uh, they're all led by the SED. And over time, this seems to get worse, from what I can tell. Uh, it, it, I didn't really read something, like, specifically focused on this. But it was kind of a feeling you got that, like, leadership got less and less collective and more concentrated in just the very top of SED leadership. And they kind of stopped listening as much to the input of other parties. So those mm-hmm. other parties, they didn't make the decisions, but they could tell you, hey, this is how our people are feeling. Mm-hmm. And that would kind of influence the whole thing. And that kind of gradually got cut out. Okay. Um, so people kind of stopped thinking that they could influence things within the political system for themselves. Okay. And I think that's, you know, what's my solution going to be to that? Mass line. Yo, you got to be doing it. It sounds like there were still asking were they still asking for input just not listening to it or they well in stopped terms asking of, no in terms of planning the economy and stuff they were I, but in terms of broader issues or, or or anything else and anything besides the technical decisions of how do we set quotas and mm-hmm. things like that you really care yeah they would get input and stuff at party meetings and things like that but it was hard to see where it translated into policy okay that makes sense and with all those weaknesses we are going to tear this down oh no it's Briefly run through the outline of the downfall okay. of the GDR. This is part of like a wider thing called the revolutions of 1989. Wow. Kind of covering the fall of communist states in Eastern Europe, eventually the fall of the Soviet Union itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, we should do like a whole episode, a, a sad episode yeah. on all that. But we're just going to focus on GDR. Okay. All right. Uh, the main reason for the downfall is the popular desire for those Western consumer goods. They want to have those wealthier things. Uh, you know, compare it to their own shortages, they're feeling jealous. Mm-hmm. That's one big thing. The de- desire for more democracy within socialism. Yeah. And the desire for an easing of travel restrictions. So the more democracy would then be related to the conversation we just had about the mm-hmm. SED kind of being the strong arm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they want to reform that. They want to feel like they have more of a voice. They want to be freer to travel. And they want more shit. Yeah. Okay. That sounds fine. Yeah. But it's going to kind of like avalanche out of control. Okay, (laughs) no. So in 1985, Mikhail Gorbachev launches the reforms in the Soviet Union, glasnost, openness, and perestroika, which means economic reforms. This kind of starts a a chain of events that other Eastern European socialist countries start following suit to varying degrees. And people within the GDR are looking at this and they've been kind of wanting a little more forms too, in terms mm-hmm. of the political stuff. And they're saying, Hey, like, what about us? You know, can, can we have some of this too? They're pretty dissatisfied. And in May, 1989, they have an election, just run of the mill. These are our general elections. Um, the national front, you know, the usual affiliation of parties, they win the election with 98.5% of the vote. That's a lot of it. Yeah. So it was too much. I think so. By this point, 
this is bringing in something we were talking about earlier, you know, they're bringing in the church groups more. There was a, a little bit of a few things going on. One was they were trying to get the Stasi to infiltrate them more and like have more control over them, but they were also trying to like get buy-in. So there was good and bad. <laughs> okay. That's not great. Uh, but one of the things they did was like, okay, you guys can like be poll watchers. You can help us like, you know, just manage the polls and, and count the totals just so you can see that we're doing a good job. The church? Yeah. Okay. All right. So you can, you can, that way you're sure that we're doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, when they, when they announced this. The, the to vote totals. The church was like, I'm pretty sure that doesn't match. <laughs> but what they had done was just say, oh, the overall number. You know, they didn't mm. report the locals. And what you what they could do, the, and the church went back and did this, or the churches did, they went back and looked at the local totals and totaled them up and said, that, that, this is not right, guys. And the funny thing is that they, you know, they did this big lie. They rigged this big election, right? You know what? They actually had 90% to 10%. Why lie about that? Why? You still won. <laughs> It's crazy. That um, just seems really risky for not very much reward. Yeah, so very stupid move there. Yeah. Uh, but that made everybody mad, right? They're they're like, you rigged the elections. They're already saying like, you don't listen to us, and now you're doing this. Uh, we're gonna see an escalation here. So June twenty seventh, nineteen eighty nine, Hungary, the Hungarian People's Republic, was now doing reforms, and they opened their border with Austria, neutral country. Hundreds of GDR citizens who were on holiday in Hungary said, hey, cool, we'll go to Austria. Oh, and fuck. then leave, and they left. Oh, fuck. So, yeah, you started, you know, it's like, holy shit, the, the, what, the so called Iron Curtain mm -hmm. or whatever was kind of opening them up. Mm -hmm. Opening up. There was, there, was, there was less border restrictions in certain places right now. Okay. All right. Hungary does not border Germany, so it was hard for this to matter yet. August 19th, 1989. Uh, you had something called the Pan-European Picnic. That sounds cute. It sounds, yeah, it sounds nice. Uh, this was a picnic at the Austrian and Hungarian border. Uh, so it was kind of meant to be anti-communist. It was not good. Oh, that's not um, good, no. Because they're trying to, like, say, hey, look, we're having this picnic on the border. You guys should open up your borders. You guys should, which is kind of good, but, like, you should open up your borders and, like, you know, join the West mm -hmm, is what they're saying. Mm -hmm. It was organized by Otto von Habsburg. Oh, like that kind of Habsburg? The Habsburg, yeah. <laughs> Why are they still around? This guy's got to be like he was a old. literal frog at this point <laughs> from the inbreeding. Well, I, th I thought this was funny. Um, he was just an anti-communist, you know. Uh, he was a practitioner of the Clint Eastwood technique, the way of the empty chair. Oh, my gosh. Uh, where he, at the European Parliament uh, in 1979, he like set up an empty chair to represent Eastern European socialist states. Oh, my God. Wow. <laughs> cool move. So he's a to total anti-communist. He sets up the pan-European picnic, celebrating open relationships between East and West. Around 900 GDR citizens who are over who are in Hungary defect at this picnic event. Uh, 100,000 citizens travel to Hungary trying to get across, and Hungary refuses to return them uh, to the GDR. And then you had Czechoslovakia. This was the Czechoslovak Socialist Republic. Okay. They also started opening their borders. That's a problem because they're right next door. Yeah. Right, so um, they start opening their border for GDR citizens to be able to go west. So you're starting to see millions of your citizens are staying. Mm -hmm. Most of them are staying. But you are seeing now a trickle of people leaving, mm -hmm. which the government has already been shown to kind of be paranoid about. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around the proportions here. So, so far we've got like 100,000 100, have left, left, basically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's kind of like... At this point, like 16 million. I mean, that's not good. Don't get me wrong. I just, it feels like, <laughs> it feels like a drastic change. I feel like everything is going okay. It's just they want more stuff. They want more stuff is the main thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Want more wealth. And again, most of them thought that they could do that and still have the sweet deals that they yeah, that's currently a enjoy. Off. You know, but they were constantly, the, <laughs> the adage goes, that after reunification, people found out everything that the communists told us about communism was a lie, but everything they told us about capitalism was true. <laughs> I like that. Uh, and obviously, I don't think the first part was necessarily true, but definitely, you know, they yeah. found out the hard way about about the, the harshness of capitalism once for they sure. left. For sure, for sure. But yeah, so you start to see this trickle of people. September 4th, 1989 is the beginning of the Monday demonstrations. 
which people, you know, went out to like public squares and stuff. And they started calling for free travel rights, more political freedom and more consumer goods slash reform. So those same things from before. Around this time, the varying times in September and going forward, uh, opposition political groups start forming too. Okay. Uh, like Democracy Now!, not like the media organization now, but <laughs> uh, Democratic Beginning and the New Forum. Uh, in October, you also had the formation of the Social Democratic Party, the SPD, which was not affiliated with the National Front at all. That's a pretty big direct challenge to the SED being the leading party and, and the National Front being the only legal thing to do. Mm -hmm. They're saying, we're going to have a different party. We're not going to join with you. What was this guy's, what were these guys' stance? Democracy Now and Democratic Beginning and the New Forum, these guys were calling for like multi-party elections. Okay. They also wanted to amend the Constitution uh, to remove the SED as the leading party and say like, we're just going to do multi-party stuff now. Man, um, okay. The Social Democratic Party were like, very reformist. Mm. So they wanted to, you know, hit the button, do the reforms, let's go. Yeah. They were still, you know, socialists, I guess, but way heavy on the Democratic side. Okay. Uh, October 7th, 1989. This is Republic Day, the 40th anniversary of the GDR. You always have celebrations, parades, things like that. Uh, they do that. They always have the Soviet premier come visit because they're friends. But the Soviet premier is now Gorbachev, uh -oh. and he's been pushing all this shit that East Germany doesn't want to do. Mm -hmm. But they invite him anyway, and they're like, "We gotta invite him. It's not gonna be good if we don't." Okay. He'll he'll you know he'll be nasty in the group chat if we don't. <laughs> uh, so he shows up, and people are chanting like "Gorby, save us!" and things like this. And, oh, uh, wait, like sarcastically or no, like make him do reforms. Oh, okay, okay, you know. And it's a it's a big deal because the party is like uh, offended, you know. Mm -hmm, just like, like oh, this sucks. Um, the the Monday demonstrations continue. They start escalating. I mean, the cops go in and beat people up. At one point, apparently, Honecker, the the SED chairman guy, you know, the he's a leader at this point. At one point, he orders a, a paratrooper unit to go in on the protesters. Holy shit! But the local party people just tell him like. No, no, we're not doing absolutely that. not. Uh, and it makes him look like a dumbass. Like, yeah, people are like, "Are you serious?" And by this point, he's really old. Uh, he's actually in bad health, um, and so people are talking about at this point, like, you maybe need to get rid of this guy. Mm -hmm. And they do. Uh, October eighteenth, nineteen eighty nine. He's lost all support in the Politburo. Everyone sees like things are getting kind of crazy, and he's not doing anything uh, to fix it. And, but they're they're disagreeing on what to do. Uh, some people are like wanting just. You know, some are honestly capitalist. You know, they, they want to restore capitalism, basically. Uh, some of them want to do a little reform. Some of them want them to be, you know, want hardline, you know, crackdowns. But they all agree Honecker is not good. Okay. So they're like, get him out. They say, oh, it's for his health. And yeah, he did have bad health, but mainly it was political. Yeah. Uh, the guy that succeeded him was a guy named Egon Krentz. He was basically a hardliner, old guard type. Uh, it didn't please the people. Because they were like, that we guy's going to do the same. We did not want that. Yeah. So protests keep happening. Uh, thousands of GDR citizens are leaving via Czechoslovakia. It's still, I mean, that's still a pretty low number, but mm -hmm. the government's panicking. They think it's going to get worse. Yeah. Uh, November 4th, 1989, you have the Alexander Plotz demonstration. Okay. Uh, this was more than half a million GDR citizens protesting in East Berlin. It was the first privately organized demonstration that the government actually, like, permitted. They were like, because it kind of had a a choice they were like well we could reject them they'll probably be pretty pissed we could let them go but like try to send the Stasi in and subvert it like what are we going to do and they mm -hmm. were just like let's let's let it happen let's see so you had this three hours long demonstration it was peaceful you had a lot of speakers you even had government officials go really talk to them yeah and they it's this is a funny example this guy named marcus wolf he was the retired head of the Foreign Intelligence Department in the Stasi. Mm -hmm. So he was like their CIA head, basically. Yeah. But retired. But anyway, he went to go talk to them. Uh, he was known in the West as, this is a cool nickname, the man without a face. <laughs> That's a really cool nickname. Because yeah, he was like elusive or whatever. Mm, um, okay. But he went and spoke to the crowd and people openly booed and heckled fuck him. Fuck yeah. They're like, fuck you. So actually, some people... Uh, you know, we're like, get him out of here. Or some people even said, like, hang him. And it's, Holy know, it's shit. crazy. A little extreme, but it, it was just wild to see 
how much from the government's perspective the wheels come off mm -hmm. right like they're willing to do this those you know the, the party officials are kind of trembling yeah November 7th, 1989, the prime minister and the entire cabinet of the government resigned because these protests keep on happening and people are demanding their resignation. So they did. Uh, the new prime minister, Hans Modrow, was more of a reformer. Okay. So they're, they're starting to change things. The top guy of the party is still there. But like the prime minister is like the second place guy. Mm -hmm. They replaced him. And the whole cabinet. November 9th, 1989, big date. Uh, the SED Politburo decides they're going to ease the travel policy because everyone's demanding it. So let's do it. GER citizens could apply for permission to travel and be more likely to be approved. Uh, there were like less strict qualifications on that. And they were also allowing for permanent emigration. So if you wanted to leave, wow. you could. The idea was that they were going to announce the policy change and get the policy change out to all the border guards and things like that and that it would go into effect the next day. So they had a press conference to announce the changes. And the guy they sent out there, a guy named Gunter Schabowski, he was like the SED leader in East Berlin. So go out there, Gunter, tell him. Uh, but he hadn't been in the room when they talked about the policy. Uh-oh. All they did was Krenz, the party leader guy, gave him a note and with, with like what the policy change was. Okay. And, but that's all it had. It just had, here are the new policies. All right? It didn't tell them when they were going to go in effect. <gasps> So the reporters are shocked. He tells them, you know, hey, we're doing all this. And they're like, oh, fuck, okay, it's happening. And they say, Shabowski, uh, when will this happen? And he says, uh, <laughs> as far as I know, it takes effect immediately without delay. <gasps> oh, no. And they're, 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 they were like, even here, Berlin, even in Berlin? And he's like, yeah, I think even Berlin. <laughs> and they like ask him again. I think Tom Brokaw is the one who's like, you can mean you right confirm? Now? <laughs> like, it's today? <laughs> yeah. And he's just like, yeah, it's today. Oh my gosh. So everyone just runs. Pandemonium, yeah. Uh, they, the, the news spread super fast. Thousands of GDR citizens begin gathering at the six checkpoints on the Berlin Wall. The guards there are like, what the fuck? What's yeah. happening? They're overwhelmed. They don't want to do anything crazy like just open fire on them or something. You know, they're not, you know. <laughs> they're not just regular cops. Right. They're not just trying to shoot people for fun. Um they, they, you know, no one gets shot or anything. The guards are trying to get an answer for the government about what to do, and they can't. So at 10.45 p.m., one of their commanders, a guy named Harold Yeager, gives the order to open the checkpoints and let people through. Uh, and they start going through, and they start collecting their 100-mark uh, greeting money, is what they called it. The, oh, the, the yeah. West Germans would basically bribe them with this to, to come over, you know. Um, and, yeah, so people started going through the checkpoints. Like this. <sighs> The chaotic way that the Berlin Wall you know, <laughs> fell. It didn't fall yeah, that day. Yeah, that's what they didn't. <laughs> yeah, they do go on to demolish it um, in the coming months. But okay. this is how it like gets opened. Yeah. So it actually wasn't Reagan saying, hey, tear it down. Yeah. You know, it wasn't, that, 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 didn't, that, that, that didn't That was in 87. Yet? That was like two oh years gosh. before. Okay. But that's how it happened is the East Germans. <laughs> Some guy fucked up at a press conference. Yeah. That's hilarious. I mean, people would have gone through, but the thing was, remember, they had to apply. They had to, like, There was a process. And, yeah. It was going to be orderly. Instead, that. Oh, my gosh. Uh, and this leads to increasing calls for German reunification, Ooh. which had not been a thing before. No. Our people at these protests are saying, you know, we are the people and saying, like, we want more of a say and stuff like that, mm -hmm. right? At this point, the slogan starts changing to, we are one people. Oh. They start saying, the wall's down. The more radical elements of, of the protesters were like, we want to just go ahead and join West Germany. You know, we don't want to just have their stuff. We want to actually join them. Mm, okay. Which is a step way further than what people had been doing. So now things start coming apart at the seams. Uh, November and December, the uh, Christian Democrats and the Liberal Democrats, the CDU and the LDPD, uh, they change leadership that kick out the kind of like pro SED guys in there and they just leave the national front. They're just like, we're not listening to you anymore. We're going to be our own party. Okay. Our own parties. Uh, December 1st, the Volkskammer. Congress, basically. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they amended the constitution to remove Article 1. That was the part about the GDR being a socialist state under the <laughs> leadership of the SED. So the SED is no longer the constitutionally leading party. December 3rd, 
General Secretary Krentz, along with the entire Politburo and Central Committee, resign. Okay. Reformists take over the leadership of the SED under a guy named Gregor Gysi, uh, and hardliners are purged from the party. Wow. So from there, the SED goes on in the coming months to abandon Marxism-Leninism and eventually changes its name to the Party of Democratic Socialism, the PSD. Mm, okay. So they, they're trying to soften it mm -hmm, up. Mm -hmm. From there, December 7th, you have the GDR Roundtable, uh, which is like a series of meetings. Okay. Uh, it's a forum about how to reform the GDR and bring about multi-party elections. Because now, remember, the reformists are in charge of the SED, so they're trying to do all the things that people have been asking for. Yeah. Surprisingly, unfortunately for your drawing, it was a rectangular table. Oh, no! <laughs> 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 yeah, that's the way. <laughs> I just thought that was a funny that side note funny. to it. Um, <laughs> you had an equal number of government-aligned representatives, so from the SED and the National Front Parties, the mass organizations, all those. Mm-hmm. Yeah, equal number of them there as you had reformist organizations. So those mm. democratic groups, um, those guys. Gotcha. You also had three moderators from the churches, uh, Protestant and Catholic churches. They didn't vote. They were just there to, like, negotiate. What they agreed to at their first meeting was to dissolve the Stasi. That's a good to one. get rid of it. I'm okay with that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to hold multi-party elections in 1990 and to draft the new constitution. So it sounds like they're not going to get to any of that. Uh, they will get to some of it. Okay. <laughs> but not all of it. All right. So then they have to have these elections, right? Uh, they hold the elections. That's March 18th, 1990. It was originally going to be a little later. And then they move it up some. The alliances, I guess, the blocks are the Alliance for Germany. That's one. This was the coalition of the Christian Democrats, the Democratic Beginning, and some conservative parties. They're like, their slogan, they're very conservative, very anti-communist, really. Uh -huh. Their slogan was, quote, never again socialism. <laughs> okay, great. They campaigned for German reunification, for private property rights, for free trade, for reestablishing the the launder, the states, uh -huh. um, and somehow also keeping the social welfare programs in place. They didn't really say how. They were just like, yeah. we're also going to do that. Well, yeah, what the fuck? <laughs> you had the Social Democratic Party. This was the anti-SED group that we talked about. Uh -huh. They were reformists. They wanted to, you know, reform the GDR into what they called an ecologically oriented social market economy. So um, kind of like a mixed economy, mm -hmm. regu basically reg really regulated capitalism. Yeah, I was going to say, like, that doesn't sound super great, but okay. And then you had the Party of Democratic Socialism, which was just the former SED, by now reformist, but not as much as the SPD. This had to be confusing because those are like the same name in that's, different order. Yeah, that's rough. Uh, their slogan was democratic freedom for all, social security for everyone. And they campaigned to reform the GDR with basically more of a focus on what they were going to keep. Okay, you know? yeah. They were like, yeah, we want to make changes, but we want to keep all the cool shit. Yeah, know? yeah. The West German parties, these most of these have the, the CDU and the SPD both had counterparts in, in Western, West Germany. Okay. And those guys flooded the place with no. money, with party uh, resources, with people to go help them try to win this election. Yep. And so the results are that the Alliance for Germany wins 48%, 192 seats in the 400-seat Volkhammer. Uh, the Social Democratic Party, those are like the re very reformist, mm -hmm. anti-SED guys, 21%, 88 seats. And then the old SED, third place, 16%. 66 seats. Mm, okay. So, yeah, it didn't turn out well for them. No. And it, they just go back to unification? Well, yeah, now you have a new Volkskammer. So you have a new parliament. April 5th, 1990, those guys sit down. Uh, they elect their prime minister, which is the chairman of the CDU, mm -hmm. a guy named Lothar de Mazieri. And he forms a coalition with the other parties, big enough to get a two-thirds supermajority, which means he can amend the Constitution. Mm -hmm. So they are going to get to that. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're not going to do a full-on new Constitution. Let's see what they do. May 18th, uh, the Volkskammer ratifies the treaty establishing a monetary, economic, and social union between West Germany and East Germany. Yep. This introduces the Deutschmark to East Germany. It transfers GDR's financial policy to 
they just turned that over to West Germany. They're just like, y'all do our financial <laughs> policy from now on. Okay. They start getting subsidies from them. And this is really the first big step to unification. I mean, if you're like uniting currencies already, you're walking, yeah, you're walking yeah. that away. Uh, June 17th, 1990, they set up something called the True Hand Estalt. Okay. Uh, the True Hand for short. But it's like T-R-E-U. In English, it's the Trust Agency. And you should not trust this agency. Uh, <laughs> they were established to privatize state-run enterprises. Oh, no. So they restructured or sold some 8,500 state-owned companies with over 4 million employees, laying off 2.5 million of them. Okay. They took over 240,000 square kilometers of state lands, farms, forests, housing, state agencies, all this. Uh, and we'll get a little bit later on after reunification talk about the work that they continue the work that they continue doing after that mm. dismantling what was once east germany but they start even while it's still a country yeah they just start liquidating the place Ugh. september 1990 finally you have the treaty on the final settlement with respect to germany it was signed in the soviet union uh, by the gdr by west germany by the Soviet Union, by the U.S., the U.K., and France. Okay. The four powers that technically still had to renounce their rights there. Mm -hmm. And then East and West Germany. It agreed that uh, GDR would join with the Federal Republic of Germany via their basic law. That law that we talked about yeah. way back when. Yeah, yeah. The basic law that said we could t still totally be together. Yeah. Okay. So on midnight, October 3rd. 1990, Germany reunified by joining West Germany, officially ceasing to exist. And now Germany, I mean, its official name is the Federal Republic of Germany. It's, that's it, that's okay. it. Okay, kept the name. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they were gone. Wow. Just like that. That was fast. <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's crazy. Like, the small demands, how they escalated so quickly. Yeah, I'm wondering, like, what could have been done to prevent that? I mean, God, it, it sounds silly, but it feels like just more treats of some kind would have really gone a long way. Yeah, I think that. I think responding quicker to making changes or at least being seen to make changes mm -hmm. early on, you know? Yeah. Uh, and then we have the aftermath. Germany set about rebuilding East Germany, which was to say they started cannibalizing state-run enterprises even more, mass privatizations, mm -hmm. liquidating the region. Uh, this was a huge, like, shock in terms of how radically, how quickly they were going about changing the economic system. It does have the effect of increasing consumer good availability. Like, that was one of the things. And yes, that happens. It does increase political freedom in terms specifically of voting for different parties. And we've you know talked about how that's not <laughs> all of what freedom should be. Yeah. Uh, and getting more free speech and more travel rights. We're going to see it does definitely come at a cost. Uh, the true hand thing from earlier kept going, selling off the holdings that it stole from people, and really at fire sale prices. Uh, factories, mills, farms, apartments, real estate, healthcare system, they have like around $2 trillion worth of assets. Holy shit. That they are just selling and pocketing the money. Wait, so the government is pocketing the money? Or who's pocketing the money? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this government agency is, is up there. It confiscates all this shit from the old government. Okay. And it's like, well, we don't we don't want to run this as a government thing for free for uh -huh. people's needs anymore. We want it to be run for profit. So uh. they sell it to people. They pocket the money and then people have to pay for that shit from there on. Yeah. Uh, they dismantled lots of productive industries in East Germany specifically to prevent competition with West German firms. They did reverse land reform. Great. They broke up collective farms to give them back to all the noble assholes they took it from before or oh their gosh. families. They also were doing that to reduce competition with West German agriculture, which was heavily subsidized. So they're just like making it a shitty side of Germany so their side could be better? In large, in a lot of ways, yes. Why? So their side could continue. To, well, so the businesses, there's supposed to be one. So the businesses that are oh, based on their okay, side could make more money. That's the thing. Okay. Yeah. There were no more job guarantees, obviously. This is capitalism after mm -hmm. all. East Germany saw like 20% unemployment after reunification. Ooh, that's a lot. 70% of women lost their jobs. Holy shit. And they knocked down that 91 number really fast. Mm -hmm. Rent. We had 5% of our income from before. 
now close to two thirds. Oh, two thirds. In that reunification period, two thirds of your income. Jesus. That's like what we have now. Well, probably <laughs> worse, honestly. Uh, what we have now is worse. Transportation, childcare, healthcare, education. Have fun paying for all of it. Privatization. Mm -hmm. uh, you got to have to wade through all the new bureaucracy of living in a new government, filling all these new forms out. Way more, actually, than what they, you know, you would think the bureaucratic, mm -hmm. you know, stereotype. Actually, you know, now you have to fill out forms for health insurance, for life insurance, for taxes, for all this shit that the government just took care of for you. Yeah, before you, know? you don't have to itemize everything because, like, it's free. No yeah. questions asked. Yeah, people were very surprised about that. Germany also put some of the GDR leaders and border guards on trial, convicting some of them. Honecker and Krentz, the last two leaders, were put on trial. Honecker, I think, gets... They let him go before convicting him because he was like in really bad health and he mm -hmm. just leaves in exile to Chile to to die. Yeah. Krenz, they convicted him of, of human rights abuses in some way or another. They also charged more than 300 GDR officials, soldiers, judges, teachers, lawyers with treason. Holy shit. Um, just like because they were working with the government. Like that they <laughs> like everybody in. was. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, most of them were acquitted, but they did imprison a few people for like just again for working for a different government. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, overall, the big picture here, Germany did pour tons of money into the development of East Germany, but really that's like the capital, you know, that capitalist term development is way different from a socialist term. It's focusing on getting this place ripe for exploitation. Yeah. Know? They're not building up schools or daycares or whatever. They're, they're selling off assets to yeah. make money. Yep. Uh, it remains the less prosperous region of Germany. Uh, it's still subsidized by the federal government. Uh, they have higher unemployment, 6.9% versus 4.8%. That was back in 2018, but that's the best number I could find. I mean, even at the beginning, we we're talking about what major cities we know in Germany. They were all on the west side. Like, yeah. that can't be an accident. Mm -hmm. They still have lower disposable income. They have like 86% of the west's disposable income. They have a lower pro productivity, which is like per capita GDP. Okay. So like how much they're making per person, I guess. And I've seen it described as like kind of like a small scale, because you know, we're going to use this word here that isn't usually used in Europe. So it's because because it's kind of very small scale, but like kind of like colonized internally. Uh huh. Not in there's because there's no real racial aspect to it or any of the other aspects of colonization. But yeah, they are an underdeveloped area mm -hmm. that gets exploited for a reason yeah yeah um and, and they're, they're kind of used as like cheap labor cheap yep. extractive labor for private enterprises of the west mm -hmm. like you said it's not really to make the west better but it's just that the businesses are there making more money okay so all these downsides like we say are paired with some material improvement you know in an absolute way you know you do get more consumer goods and stuff like that that's true but again you got to think of like how much of it this sea of opulence that I'm in now. How much of it can I afford? Yeah, you know? yeah. I don't have healthcare anymore. It's different for different people. There's mm -hmm. a there's a concept called nostalgia, which is a portmanteau Eastern of, nostalgia. Yeah, there exactly. we go. Um, nostalgia for the GR. It is not universal. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who were glad and continue to be glad about reunification. For sure. There were people who hated the GDR or people who just thought it wasn't that great and are glad that it's gone. But I think that what gets lost in the story that we're told in common received history in America and in Western countries is that this was an unmitigated good. Mm -hmm. That you know that, that people say this was just great. It freed so many people and now they enjoy happy lives and they're no longer suffering under communism. Yeah. What I would say is like, there are people who feel like they've come from a different timeline because what they remember is a good society mm -hmm. like that had problems like any society does, but that cared for its people. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And they're, they're left thinking like, am I crazy? Like everyone's telling me, you know, this is that I shouldn't miss this thing that I miss. You know, I think that's wild. Yeah, for sure. Um, lots of people, you know, kind of look back on it fondly. I found something interesting that, that, there are German businesses now that are like capitalizing on this. They're like making um, kind of old kitschy versions, like retro labels and shit oh my gosh. from products that people used to have in the GDR. Like, oh, that's weird. Yeah. It's, uh, it's just messed up. That's but, a little gross. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's where we're, 
that's kind of where we end of the story is yeah on this downer note <laughs> yeah so i mean so you had sent me a video I, i'm assuming from that documentary you watched yes yeah. yeah so and and the video was an interview with this woman um like an older woman and she was talking about like the banana thing mm. so like there's a common argument in a, in and about i guess socialist communities where like you lack access to luxury goods. And so one of the first things people bring up is kind of exotic foods. Like, oh, you won't get oranges and bananas and yeah. like coconuts or whatever. It's something that comes up all the time when we're talking about like, oh, what if we did the communes and stuff? Mm -hmm. Like, well, how do we get, yeah. <laughs> and this woman is like, yeah, I mean, bananas are rare, but like, would I rather have like healthcare and daycare and like a good life or mm -hmm. bananas? Like, I think I'm going to take the other stuff over yeah. bananas. And that's what this whole thing feels like. It feels like a, a very short-sighted way to look at things and say like, oh, these people are quote unquote suffering. And it's like, yeah, they don't have the same things as we do, but that doesn't mean they're suffering. Yeah. And I think that it's tragic because especially early on when, when, when things were first sliding toward reunification, people were actually just trying to fix things. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Because it does seem like the SED had too much control it do, I mean, the Stasi, that's not good. We should definitely get rid of that. Like, I agree with some of the points. Yeah. But it didn't have to turn into all that. Yeah, yeah. Like, they thought and, and they believed that they could make these changes and, and, and improve their lives materially while still having all of those social benefits. Yeah, for real. You know, even the party they were, you know, that they ended up voting for, but the, the very conservative people who were saying, let's do reunification Let's do all these privatization stuff, but let's keep these policies because they knew like that was popular. Yeah. You know, people supported that. They wanted to be taken care of, to have a humane society like the one they built. They just wanted it to be better. And what they got instead was shit. Yeah. They got a fucking raw deal. Yeah. And then, yeah, that had to be very disconcerting to have everyone in the world be like, we did it. You go from, yeah, this is crazy because you go from. <laughs> Having a job guarantee, mm -hmm. right, to make money that you can spend kind of however, because you're spending only 5% of it on rent, yeah. all, all these things taken care of for you to 20% unemployment. And not only that, not only do you not have a job now, but you also have to pay for all the shit that you used to get for free. Yeah. Like, Which is crazy. The rent thing alone blows my mind. Like, you went from paying 5% to two-thirds of your income on rent. That is bonkers. Like, where mm -hmm. are you getting that money? Yeah, it's you're not. You're just living in poverty for most part. You know, it, it's it's only recently that East Germany started reversing a downward trend in population because things were so bad there. Yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's only started to improve lately. But yeah, that's the story. And wow. I get it. We're we're always going to give you the communist perspective. You yeah, know? like that's that's what we do for sure. <laughs> and like to acknowledge like it affected people in different ways yeah so you know if if your particular story or family background like experiences poorly that's not to negate any of that right I, I think that that perspective though is very widespread mm -hmm. and we see a lot of it. we do you know? we absolutely do so this is kind of to introduce the you know from the perspective of other people who liked lots of what was happening before not the whole thing but who would really rather have seen a socialist state continue. Yeah. I mean, looking back at my notes, I think I only had one strike. You had the Stasi? I had the Stasi. Maybe the, the SED thing that I don't, I didn't like when they stopped listening to people. That's going to be strike two. Falling away from the masses. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's very important. All right. That's, uh, that's the GDR. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm tired. Uh, I had to like, really pay attention because I was taking notes the whole time. Yeah. It was tough. <laughs> so some of my notes are cute and some of them are ugly. We're going to try this. I don't know if it's going to work. If you don't like it, that's fine. <laughs> you don't have to look at it if you, you don't like it. You can tell us and then we won't have to do it anymore. Yeah. I'm going to think of a better format, I think, mm -hmm. for next time. What do people tell us, but we don't listen to them? We are just like, whatever. We're mm, then we're going to be part of the problem. Yep. <laughs> no, can't do that. I think I got too caught up in writing things. I should focus more on the drawing. Yeah, I so, think that's where. I think next time I'm going to do that. I think actually for this one, I might just redraw my favorite doodles and post that. And then next time I'll be more doodle focused. Okay. Some some inside baseball here for you. <laughs> <laughs> it may get cut for time. We'll see. We'll see. All right. What are we doing next week? 
Next week, I'm up, and I have a little bit of what I'm calling a grab bag of an episode. Ooh, okay. So these are like small little bits of stories that I've had saved in my just notes uh, for a while now. And I started researching them, and they're like fun, but they're not quite juicy enough for a whole episode. Okay. So I have like at least two, maybe three of these stories that we're going to talk about. All right. So, so yeah. kind of like a, an article reading or... Um, no, more like, like mini history stuff. Mm, okay. So, um, little vignettes. Yeah. Yeah. So preview one is a story about a Texas labor strike. Ooh. It takes place in East Texas, actually. So wow. we're going to see a lot of familiar names. All right. And then I'm looking at a story about, um, some Roman senators from back in the day. Okay. And the other ones are very small. So yeah. yeah. All right. Sounds great. Cool. I'll talk to you then. Sounds good. Bye. Bye. Hey there, comrades. Just jumping in to remind you of all of our social media. We are on Twitter at Teach Communism, Instagram at Teach Me Communism. You can shoot us an email. That's teachmecommunism at gmail.com. Any of those places are good to send us an episode suggestion or a question, anything you think would be useful feedback for us or just your admiration. If you want to admire us in a public manner, and you should, you can go to Apple Podcasts to give us a review. It is the best way to help people find the show. Love when people write and review us. Please do both. We are also on YouTube if that's how you prefer to listen to podcasts, or if you know someone that's the only way they'll listen to podcasts, send them to our page. And we have a Patreon. For five bucks a month, you get access to our notes for each week's episode, including the backlog of notes, which is a very handy resource for up and coming commies. And at the end of the year, all of the funds from Patreon will be given to local mutual aid in the DFW area. So ain't going to line our pockets. Finally, we have merch. Check us out at Tee Public. You can find shirts and I believe also stickers and magnets and all kinds of fun stuff with catchphrases from the show or episode art, stuff like that. The link to that store is in the show notes, so check that out. Okay, that's all the internet. Join us next time for another episode of Teach Me Communism, where the class struggle is always in session. Bye, y'all.